Good day, and hello from Karlsruhe, Germany. We're holding the FieldCom Group virtual workshop here to showcase the demo system that thanks to the generosity of many of our members, we've been able to build to highlight advanced technologies in process automation. I'm Paul Sirico, and with me today live is Sean Vincent. Hello. During the course of this workshop, we'll be joined by several subject matter experts for presentations and demonstrations of key technologies, including FDI, Hard IP, Ethernet APL, and PA DIM. But before we go too much further, we'd like to thank our member companies, including ABB, Alma, CodeWrites, Emerson, Andrus Hauser, FlowServe, Krona, PR Electronics, Pepperell Fuchs, Phoenix Contact, Samson, Siemens, Smart Embedded Systems, and Vega. These companies all provided hardware and software to make the demo system sitting behind us a reality. It showcases all of our technology um, and it, 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 it's really well done. If you are a member or an end user and are interested in providing equipment for this demo, or in scheduling time to use the demo system for presentations to your customers or project or project stakeholders, please reach out to us at marketing at fieldcomgroup.org and we'll be happy to assist you. The system is available via secure remote access, including lighting and cameras 24 hours a day from anywhere in the world. We've got great instructions on how to use it and what you can do with it. We have quite a bit of content to share with you today, and now I'd like to turn it over to Sean for a review of the agenda and a bit of information on using the Whova application. Hello. I'm happy to announce that we have over 300 registrations for the workshop representing users, suppliers, and EPCs from around the globe. We have a lot of content to cover, so I'll give you an overview of the day. We split the day into three sessions with five minute breaks between the sessions. During session one, we will outline some of the major trends that will impact process automation in the coming decade, and how the FieldCom Group has created a strategic technology plan to address these changes. Session two will focus on changes to plant infrastructure, most notably, the expected adoption of Ethernet at the field with Ethernet APL, and how FieldCom Group's heart for the 21st century initiative represents the simplest and most reliable application protocol to use when transitioning to this exciting new physical layer. Finally, we'll spend some time discussing the importance of reliably interpreting information for multiple devices, systems, and facilities at the enterprise level with IT-friendly technology. FieldCom Group's PADEM technology provides the solution and in accordance with user requirements developed by Nemour, bridges the gap between OT and IT systems. Now for a few notes on the tools for today. We're using the Whova as a delivery platform for this workshop. Notice on the right side of your Whova screen is a panel for asking questions. We'll do our best to get questions answered in real time. But prior to each break, we'll also take a moment to address any unanswered questions. Finally, if your question is not answered during today's workshop, we'll follow up afterwards. And now, I think we're ready to start our first session. Okay. Well, in June of this year, FieldCom Group was proud to be a part of the launch of the Ethernet APL physical layer. We feel strongly that Ethernet to the field in process automation will fundamentally change the design of new facilities and heavily influence retrofits for existing facilities. Now, it's going to take a while, but these are some important messages for folks. This means that suppliers, including most of our members, should quickly adapt their products to support Ethernet APL and the other advanced technologies like PADIM that we'll be discussing today. It also means that users need to carve precious resources out of their budgets to learn, experiment, and adopt new technologies or risk being faced with obsolete facilities. And finally, it means that organizations like FieldCom Group must create the standards, tools, and conformance programs to assure multi-vendor interoperability during this technology transition. Now, from the title of this workshop, we'll obviously be addressing advanced technologies for process automation. 
But I thought it'd be interesting to very briefly review some of the predecessor technology that has helped process automation evolve through the ages. Way back in 250 BC, Setsibius developed the water, the water clock. Now the water clock is believed to be um, the first closed loop control system ever created. You basically poured water into the top of this, uh, of this pot, it spun some gears, the gears in turn told time, and if you needed to slow down or change it, there was a mechanism for changing the rate of water flow um, to make sure that the time was, was constant, was, was, was accurate. So um, that was a long time ago that, that we have had closed loop control in the world. Let's zoom forward a couple of millennia and talk a little bit about something that's still, still around. Uh, that's pneumatic systems. We still use pneumatics a lot for controlling for, for valve controllers and, and deep sea things and uh, a, lot of other, uh, a lot of other applications. Um, but or, you know, originally pneumatics were actually used to control sensors. They were, uh, you know, they were using, you use three to 15 pounds per square inch as a way to measure, um, you know, temperature and pressure and a variety of other things back in the days before electronics. Of course, we all know that the electronic revolution um, came fast and four to 20 milliamps sometime in the, you know, the mid 20th century, 1950s, 1960s, uh, began to be used quite frequently in process automation facilities. And eventually, um, the, uh, the heart tech Technology protocol, the original 4 to 20 milliamp heart protocol, um, was put on top of, uh, uh, of these 4 to 20 milliamp transmitters. And today, they are still, far and away, the largest sales percentage by volume of uh, instrumentation sold um, globally and, and worldwide. And it's, it's not really slowing down all that much. Uh, then, we, uh, you know, but we did try, and in, in, in the mid, you know, in the late 20th century, field bus systems came about. Field bus represented the first. Uh, use of digital, full digital technology in process automation. And products like Foundation Field Bus and Profi Bus um, have enjoyed great success in some regions of the world in some very specific applications as those first digital, fully digital um, communication systems. Then finally, right at the end of the century, um, wireless came into being. You know, our horse in this race obviously is a wireless heart, uh, but there's other wireless protocols out there. There's ISA 100, there's Wi-Fi, there's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting things. Um, and wireless really holds uh, a lot of promise for implementing and executing some of the things that are very important to Namur, like the Namur Open Architecture monitoring and optimization um, applications. So wireless is the latest uh, physical new physical layer until Ethernet APL. Um, but I'd like to close on one additional technology. Um, and I'd like to spend a few minutes highlighting FDI technology. FDI is an integration technology, not a protocol. And the FDI device package is the new standard for deploying all the software, user interfaces, and documentation for a device for a specific protocol. FDI supports many automation pro protocols shown on this slide and in includes key user required features like security, offline configuration, offline repositories, uh, or rather online repositories uh, for registered device packages and etc. Please check out our askforfdi.com site for more information on this. Okay, now the message from these prior slides is that process automation technology is constantly evolving. And like many other industries, the evolution is happening at an accelerating rate. So what's next? Well, to answer that question, we've engaged Peter Zornia, who is a FieldCom Group board member and the CTO of Emerson Automation Solutions, to look into the crystal ball and comment on the three core technologies that will re-architect the automation industry. Let's take a look at, um, at what Peter has to say now. I'm coming to you here from our integrated plant environment that we have in Shakopee, Minnesota. We test out a lot of technology here and we train a lot of customers in this facility. Today, I'm going to talk to you about three of the big technology changes that we see coming that we think are going to dramatically change the automation and operations environment. So if we start by looking at the way things are today, 
you know, in most plants, you typically have a control system, PLCs, DCS systems. Some plants have safety systems if they have hazardous processes, a variety of different field instruments, and a variety of software applications that go on top of those automation systems. The software applications are typically running at the plant level on Windows computers. And of course, the control system is also typically on the facility and it's connected to the field devices with a very wide variety of different protocols today. One of the big changes that's coming and one of the technologies I'm gonna talk about is advanced physical layer. And the advanced physical layer is going to bring ethernet to all those field devices, unify those field devices with the control system in a much stronger way and just unleash a whole bunch of new data from the field. The next technology change I'm going to talk about is cloud. So if we look at cloud today, yes, IT departments in most customers are using cloud in the enterprise world. Cloud has become very popular and grown very fast. I'll have some data where I'll show you that. But it's typically been for those IT and enterprise applications. And it's connected to automation systems or data centers inside the customer's facility are connected to the automation systems with a number of carefully engineered bespoke connections. One of the things we see changing is cloud coming down into more and more automation and, uh, and operations applications. And we also see SaaS models, the models where instead of hosting the applications yourself, the vendor of those applications, such as us, Emerson, will host those and you will just subscribe to them in a SaaS kind of model. Or you may also tie into our connected services where we are analyzing data for you and telling you what's going on. So cloud is one of the second technology changes that I'll talk about. The third technology change I'll discuss is really more of an entire architecture than it is a technology. And that's what I like to call the enterprise OT system. So typically we've always counted on the automation system as the thing that pulled in data from field devices. But with digital transformation, what we see happening now is a whole new architecture being built, outlined here in gray, where new field devices, new edge devices are all generating data and doing analytics down at the plant level. And we also see new aggregation technologies for tying that together that we call the OT data lake. And that is also becoming the way to shepherd all that data as well as the existing automation data into the cloud environment. So the enterprise OT system is the third, more than a technology, let's call it new architecture that I am going to discuss today. So these three technologies are gonna dramatically change and shift what the overall operations architecture looks like over the next coming years. Let's start and look at a little more detail at Ethernet APL. So traditionally in the process industries, the most common connection from field devices to the automation systems is four to 20 milliamps. And often it's accompanied by the heart protocol that carries some digital data. Then there's also a number of other protocols that have been used, typically on Ethernet today, such as Profinet or Ethernet IP or, or even Modbus TCP running the old Modbus protocol over Ethernet. Ethernet is great. It has fast communication, high bandwidth, everyone uses it. It's easy to integrate IT and OT data, but it has big barriers when you try to use it in process facilities. First of all, Ethernet does not support a simple two wire communications. You need special ethernet cable. It has limited distance. And in most cases, it requires separate device power. So it's not nearly as simple to install as the two wire four to 20 and other analog connections that we're used to for field devices. It's also not capable of being intrinsically safe, which is an important safety requirement in many chemical facilities. Ethernet APL is going to change all that. Ethernet APL is a new physical layer that runs all those existing Ethernet protocols, but runs them over a physical infrastructure that meets the installation requirements of hazardous processes. 
Ethernet APL will be much faster than protocols such as Hard or Foundation Field Bus. It'll be 10 megabits. It will still support, however, that two-wire simple communication, power on those two wires, and the field device part will run for 200 meters from the nearest junction box that contains an Ethernet APL switch. So Ethernet APL is a way to extend the plant Ethernet architecture and plant Ethernet network into field devices in an intrinsically safe way while still providing power. Now it's not a new protocol, it's going to still run all the same protocols that we run on traditional ethernet. If we think about, you know, who's going to be involved in ethernet APL, well, first of all, the standards themselves have been defined in International Standards Committee, the IEEE or the Electrical Engineering Group and the IEC. But there's also a consortium of vendors that we call the uh, ethernet APL working group whose names you can see here, Emerson is a member, that are working together to help bring this new technology into the industry. They're also the group that's working on the intrinsically safe definition of what this protocol, of what this field level technology will look like. There's also a number of protocol organizations that are part of this working group, and you can see their names there as well. Because again, Ethernet EPL is just a physical layer. It's just the communications media, it's not the protocol. And all the same protocols that we see on Ethernet, we will find on Ethernet APL. Now, why would you use Ethernet APL? Well, as I mentioned earlier, one of the biggest and most attractive features is the amount of data and the speed at which you can send that data. The benefit of having that is going to vary greatly depending on the type of device you're connecting and the type of information that's in that device. So what I've done on this chart is I've listed a number of the traditional kinds of devices that you will find in a process facility today. From general order to which I think they're going to benefit the most and have the most kind of data to offer on Ethernet APL to the ones that may be just consistency in having a single type of architecture is going to be the biggest driver for APL. We have a number of devices here, the ones at the top, such as Coriolis meters or gas chromatographs, that are already using off-the-shelf Ethernet where they can, where they're in facilities that don't need intrinsic safety and they can meet the distance limitations because they have a lot of data and that ability to bring in all that data is extremely important for those kinds of devices. What I expect to happen with APL is that middle band of devices that you see there, things such as a radar level or a multivariable transmitter, a digital valve positioner, those are the devices that are really going to benefit from Ethernet APL, from the ability to have this high speed data pipe in an intrinsically safe manner, but with the same ease of installation that we have today with our 4 to 20 connections. As we get to simpler devices like pressure and temperature transmitters, they have intelligence, they have data, but not to the same quantity. And frankly, the heart protocols work pretty well over 4 to 20 for those devices. But as we move to having APL kind of widely available and widely installed in a plant, it's going to make sense to bring those to APL as well and have a consistent architecture, as well as we'll think of, like we always do, new features and capabilities to take advantage of that new bandwidth and also the new power that Ethernet APL is going to bring that will enable us to run more functions and have more memory in those devices. There is a class of very simple device that I think will probably never directly talk Ethernet APL. What we'll see there is transmitters or what I call APL aggregators, you know, a, a device that shows up as a symbol, as a single APL device, but then connects to a number of simpler devices such as push buttons or other limit switches, other discrete inputs or outputs. So in the future, it's going to take quite a number of years. I do think we will see APL becoming a prominent and pervasive technology inside of our field environments. The second technology I mentioned was cloud and this idea of cloud becoming more popular and more deployed in OT environments. Let's take a closer look at that. If we look at just computing in general and over the last 50 years, I've been around for a while. I've seen some of these changes. 
you know, we've gone through a number of different platforms all the way from when computing first started, you know, let's say in the 1970s from mainframes through Unix workstations. And then the standard platform of the of really the 21st century in the late 90s was Wintel, Windows on Intel machines. And that's been how automation systems are built. I don't know of an automation system today that doesn't use Wintel. Uh, and that's been the, the standard in the IT world as well until about 10 years ago. About 10 years ago, IT started using a lot more cloud technology and public cloud, which is centralized, highly scalable, and they're going to be accelerating their usage of this technology as you see. Traditionally, in the automation and OT world, we have taken IT's lead and adopted technology into our world, and I think that's happening right now with cloud. Again, traditionally, there's been a separation, a connection, but a separation traditionally between the platforms that OT uses and the applications we have on these Wintel machines, such as control or historian or manufacturing execution systems, and those enterprise level applications that the IT world has run in the cloud environment and prior to the cloud environment in their own data centers. But what we see happening today, and you hear a lot of talk about this described as IT OT collaboration or IT OT convergence, is that IT technology is making its way into more and more OT type applications. And IT organizations, as you can see from this chart, you know, the amount of investment in IT, especially in manufacturing, is always increasing as people have digital transformation programs and they look at how they can make their manufacturing more efficient. And you'll see that where they're spending their money, no surprise, is on cloud infrastructure and cloud applications. So for sure, IT is pushing hard on cloud and for sure, IT is spending more money on developing more applications and developing more capability. And what we've seen is IT organizations beginning to directly tackle operation problems, running analytics inside the cloud, running analytics inside from cloud manufacturers or other cloud software to come down and directly tackle OT problems. Sometimes that's done maybe a little too independently from what's happening in the operational technology world from our experience, but for sure that's going on. So in addition to this idea of, of IT coming in and starting to pull data into the cloud and doing some OT applications themselves, the applications are moving to executing. The ones you already have are moving to executing inside the cloud, not control, we don't see control moving for a long time. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But some of the other higher level, more we used to call Purdue model level four type applications, such as a data historian or data concentration, those type of applications are people are, as people are more comfortable with the cloud and are okay with the security and availability of the cloud, we see those applications being executed in a cloud environment. We also see the cloud vendors, companies such as uh, AWS or Microsoft Azure, building some of their own cloud native solutions for data integration, data management, some of the functions that some of those software applications down on the bottom level are already doing. So the cloud guys are, are moving into pulling in time series and other types of data and providing analytical tools on top of that data, many times that look a lot like solutions we're more familiar with as coming from OT specific kind of vendors. Now, why is that going on? Well, let's talk about two reasons. First, let's talk about why cloud, okay? Well, cloud has many benefits, which is why the IT industry is moving strongly towards cloud technology. When something's in the cloud, you can access it anywhere. I mean, cloud is what has enabled all these wonderful portable computers that we all carry in our pocket as a terminal to cloud devices. It can be highly secure, there's no capital investment, it's infinitely scalable, it's easy to see why the IT world is moving towards cloud. Why are the cloud guys moving towards OT? Why are the cloud guys moving to adding some of these applications? Well, when we think of IoT and of collecting data, it's easy to think of industrial because that's the world we all live in, but IoT is a huge market that spans many industries. 
Think of all the data streaming off of cars right now, the data that will be streaming off of smart buildings, the data that streams off of even things like farms today. And what the cloud guys realize is that a core infrastructure for all of this data to collect, process, and visualize it is something that can be consistent across all these industries. And that's why we're seeing them invest heavily in cloud. So the obvious question is, where are different applications gonna go? What is the right split of applications that I need to stay on premise versus applications that could go to the cloud or applications that might go and stay in a corporate data center? That's a good question. That's a transition we're gonna see happening and it's gonna depend heavily in many cases on the type of process you run and it's going to depend on your appetite and, and belief in the cloud and your appetite for risk. However, Namur, the, uh, the chemical industry organization that I think most Akama attendees would be familiar with, uh, it's populated mostly by European, strongly German-based uh, chemical companies, has put together a whole document called NE175 where they talk about this architecture of the future and some of the changes that will be coming. And I think they've done a very good job of, of diagramming you know, where different functions are probably going to land. Because one of the things that they do document that I think is very true is that most customers are going to continue to want their critical base automation and critical base control functions to be able to operate without the cloud. To, if they lose internet connection, that their core automation inside of a plant facility can continue to operate uninterrupted. So that is in this picture that you see here from Namur. You know, this is what they call their open architecture or NOAA. That's the gray box, the core process control. And you can see they show it at the production plant, not running in the cloud. But then as we leave that core automation system and you see the clouds in the pink boxes, that's opening up the world for all those kinds of applications to potentially be moved to the cloud, including a number of applications that, as I mentioned earlier, we traditionally see being on premise today, such as advanced control or a historian, as well as new applications such as centralized reliability centers. So this chart is a, a great picture of you know, where some of the separation could go between on premise and cloud, but it's also a great picture of the next topic I'm gonna to talk about, or the third topic, which is the enterprise OT system. Okay, we've talked about how there's gonna be all new technology in the automation world. We talked about how cloud is gonna be a new computing platform for many traditional OT applications. But what I'm talking about here is actually an entirely new architecture that we see evolving, an entirely new system, really very similar to the pink boxes that you saw on the Namur chart, that as I mentioned, I call the enterprise OT system. And this is a whole set of new capability, new sensors, new applications, targeted not at automation, but other plant operational functions. So energy management, reliability and availability are probably one of the biggest ones that we see. Enabling workflow, automating workflow for operations inside of the plant. All these kinds of applications that aren't directly automation, but are very strongly tied to operations and operations procedure. And these platforms really are trying to automate and close the loop around a lot of other functions that have been traditionally manual in the operations world. One of the big drivers and the starting point for all of this to happen is a whole new family and a whole new set of intelligent devices, typically wireless, to gather new data in those new application areas. Whether it's energy consumption, equipment health, parameters such as vibration, any sort of new, new signal type or new sensor that we'd like to have that's going to provide us data in these new application areas. And you can see a number of those kinds of applications listed down at the bottom of this chart that we, Emerson, have provided as part of our portfolio. So things such as vibration and acoustic monitoring that we can use for many applications. That data is then fed into either gateways to just move the data along, or sometimes the gateways themselves host applications, or edge computing devices. Devices mounted at the plant level, edge computing is one of those great terms that has a lot of different definitions. For me, 
It means it's at the plant level, close to where the data is generated. And then ingesting that data and running software and applications right there at that plant level to analyze and drive actionable results from, anal from analyzing that data. And there's a whole new family of devices in this area. We have some of our own. Many manufacturers are making them. And of course, there's a big discussion all the time about whether data should be processed and run at the edge, at the plant level, or in the cloud, as I talked about earlier. More on that in a minute. Why are people collecting all this data? They're collecting all this data to run analytics and software, as I mentioned. This is another area we could do a, a whole presentation on, but to try to sum it up in one chart, this is a chart we've put together. There really are layers of analytics that have to occur. Plants are made up of or are very complex uh, mechanisms, if you will, or systems that are made up from elemental components to simple assets like motors and heat exchangers to more complex assets, like a complete process unit to looking at the entire process plant itself, okay? There are different analytics technologies. A lot of attention has gone into machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques where you do pattern recognition and look at sets of data without any kind of intrinsic knowledge about what the process might be doing or what we might call first principle knowledge about what's happening in the process. From our perspective, as we go down the chain and we look at simple assets, we know the models, we know how a pump works, we have the Bernoulli equation, we know what causes cavitation, we know all those things, okay? We don't need AI at that level, we need a simple way to implement the first principle and failure mode effects models that we know exist at those devices. Edge computing is a great way to do that and a great way to do that in a way that that data is generated at the plant and can be supported by plant devices. As we move up into more complex systems, such as the entire plant itself, that's where the data-driven, more machine learning type technology comes into play. Because now we don't have always highly accurate models for how this very complex system works together. And these technologies, these data-driven models provide a great way to get a model, if you have enough data, to tell you what's going on and provide correlations. Now, all that data, though typically still floats up in the architecture, lands in a customer data center, more often now lands in a customer's cloud where they're applying big data analytics and AI and machine learning and other kinds of tools that they may be supporting, they may be using tools that are supplied directly by the cloud vendor, or they may be using third-party software that's intended for this big data cloud type application stuff. One of the big issues we see, and I think a lot of, of people who have, who have worked in this area and are trying to do you know, big data analytics, looking across an entire facility or fleets of facilities is, okay, maybe you can get all the data in, build individual connections, but once it's there, you know, do you end up with a data lake or do you end up with, you know, as the picture shows, you're a data swap? Because although you may have all the data there, unless you have clean data that you know is reliable, and unless you have the data in context, unless you really are able to compare sets of data from different data sources together in a consistent manner, you can't do what you're trying to do, which is run the analytics. So one of the common practices we've seen is, you know, from the cloud, as I showed in my earlier chart, build individual connections to all the different OT systems, the historian, the lab system, the reliability, you know, CMMS, whatever it may be, pull those in. But then what happens is the data may not be at all in a usable context. And then you have to go through a transformation for every type of application that you're trying to use. And it can be as simple as things being called slightly different names from two different data sources. So the actual putting the data together in an integrated manner in a contextualized way is a core basis that you need to have before you really can start running these cloud level analytics. And this is what it looks like today. All these different OT data sources, including these edge devices with individual connections, individual security, and the poor person trying to do analytics has to go through and sort through this different data and put it all into a context that enables them to do the application that they're trying to do. That's not 
a sustainable model if we really expect to do analytics in a big way. The best practice, the best practice is to have something that we call an OT data lake, a platform, an a software environment where it's designed to pull in the data from all these different sources, not just the streaming data, but data that might be other kind of unstructured data. So it could be text, it could be pictures, it could be vibration spectrum, able to store all these different types and then apply a uniform model such as ISA 95 to provide context around all that different data. So if we look at these three technologies that I talked about today, and as I said, one of them is really more than a technology. This is a major change that we're going to see happening to the operations environment, the automation and computing environment for different operations functions. APL is going to dramatically increase that field information and, and really redefine the integration between automation and the field. Many of the operations applications are going to do what the IT colleagues have already done, move their applications to the cloud or start subscribing to them in a SaaS model. And driven by digital transformation and the need to improve performance, we're going to see that gray architecture continue to be installed and grow as an entirely new operations performance kind of architecture, but at a big scale and at the enterprise level. So that is what I wanted to talk to you about today. And thank you very much for your attention. So we built this demo system to basically take advantage of some of these advanced applications that we know are, um, you know, are coming our way. We've got a couple of um, edge gateways here. We've got one from um, PNF and Code Rights, and we've got another one from Phoenix Contact. All of the host systems here support FDI technology, and um, overall, it's uh, you know we're we're primed and ready to produce some of these uh, to 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 address some of these uh, trends that Peter is that Peter mentioned momentarily. Ago, um, he did a couple of things also that I thought were, were interesting. He he talked about the data swamp, <laughs> and you know, towards the end of this presentation, you're going to hear a lot from um, you're going to hear a lot from um, Frank Fangler at ABB and Sean, and they're going to talk about the PA DIM technology and how great that is for uh, you know for doing this uh, you know for 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 up making the data lake instead of the data swamp. So when I first watched Mr. Zornio's video earlier this year, um, I. I really felt it was a very clear and concise explanation of the coming trends in process automation. Um, and that's why we wanted to show it here today. I hope that you enjoyed that video as well. Um, and now we're going to get down a little bit more to, to brass tacks. So naturally, implementing the technology shift that we just discussed requires quite a bit of effort on the part of standards organizations like FieldCom Group. And the rather complex diagram on the screen represents how we plan to build out our PAR technology portfolio to meet the challenge. Let's turn now to Ted Masters, the president and CEO of FieldCom Group, and Andy Cutchin, the chair of our strategic technology committee, for an explanation of this rather complex chart that you're looking at at the moment. Thank you for attending FieldCom Group's session on digital transformation in the process automation industry. FieldCom Group, as you may know, is the home of process automation standards. Our mission is solely focused on the process industry and developing standards for our 380 plus supplier members to help their user customers improve their operations. The expertise of our members representing nearly all key suppliers to the process industry and our focus on digitalization gives us a great understanding of the needs of our users to leverage data from field devices. To turn this data into value, our users need standard ways to organize the data in hosts, mobile and cloud applications, regardless of the communication protocol by which it's delivered, regardless of the supplier of the device, and combining both an installed base of field devices with the latest technology purchased today. The FieldCom Group technology portfolio that you'll hear about today solves all these issues for our users. A portfolio developed over the last several years of both building new technologies hand in hand with our members and users enhancing existing technologies to meet the needs of, the, of their future. Digitalization has driven investment in our portfolio 
portfolio for Heart, Wireless Heart, and Heart IP, the latter of which now enables users to leverage the fam familiarity of Heart on the new standard physical layer you'll be hearing about Ethernet APL. A critical factor to maximizing the value of data is delivering it in a common information model for our industry, PADM, the Process Automation Device Information Model. This OPCUA companion standard is shared by, uh, by standards development organizations as the standard for the industry and designed to fit the needs of our users, uh, such as uh, mirror open architecture. FDI is the new integration technology, which is now becoming the integration standard for users and allows for a premium user experience to configure and commission field devices. Further, it provides a bridge for data from installed devices to be delivered in the common PADM information model, making the data from these installed devices compatible with those from new technologies with PADM directly on the device. I'm pleased today to introduce Andy Cutchin, the chairman of Philcom Group's Strategic Technology Committee, who will tell you more about how these technologies deliver a complete solution to digitalize your plant and enterprise in a way to provide complete interoperability of devices and protect the investment of your installed base of Philcom Group technologies in your plants today. Andy? Thank you very much, Ted. <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. My name is Andy Cutchin. I am an Emerson employee who works with Philcom Group as chairman of the Philcom Group Strategic Technology Committee. And we'll be talking about the portfolio of technology that Philcom Group has uh, on offer today and is in the process of developing to enable digital transformation in the process automation industry. So looking at the existing portfolio, we rewound this back just a little bit from where Philcom Group is today. We see that the, the key technologies that have for a number of years made up the Fieldcom Group uh, portfolio supporting the process automation industry are, of course, Heart and Foundation Field Bus, and then most recently, FDI. And in the, the Heart family, we have the standard 4 to 20 milliamp wired Heart communication, and we also have our, found, uh, our wireless Heart uh, communication that, that's available. And then there's also Heart IP, but we'll talk about Heart IP a little bit more. Uh, in just a few moments because there are some exciting developments there. At the same time, the while these provide a way to integrate devices into the system for control purposes and for gathering data, FDI provides a way to gather that information and make it available to the user, to the workstations, to maintenance uh, systems um, in a way that's, that's standard and provides a good user experience. As we move forward, we see that expanding uh, with FDI making these devices more and more accessible. We have new technologies. We have the UIP that's available now as part of the FDI device package. It's available in HTML5 now, a change from the, the previous technology that was used. And this can allow vendors to provide a more standard user experience um, for the configuration and interaction with their devices, as well as um, providing the, op the opportunity for more standardized and, and um, seamless sort of experience across vendors and within a single host. Um, we also see new opportunities for even in the handheld sort of world where these same sorts of FDI technologies can be leveraged even on handhelds in their interaction with, uh, with the field devices out in the field itself. We also uh, have um, uh, the process automation uh, device information model, PADEM, this is a new standard OPC UA companion spec that defines a model for all process automation devices. And so this is a, a standard sort of information model, whereas historically um, we have like the heart common practice and, and, and the universal commands. Now this is a, a, instead an information model that's standardized, um, whereas it's traditionally been, been vendor specific. And so this means that the most common sorts of data that you would find in a process automation device is now available as part of this, this standard model so that there's a, a standardized way of interacting with it. It uses the OPC UA technology that, that many in the industry are familiar with, making it easier to integrate devices uh, directly and making it possible for them to be less vendor specific in the way they're integrated into the larger plant. And so what we see is 
Telecom Group is making investments in the existing FDI technology, and that's this, these red boxes that you'll see appearing on the diagram here. So we're making investments in those existing FDI technologies to, to make devices more accessible, accessible. And we're also seeing that there's a need in the market to simplify the development of applications and have this common information model. And so we're addressing that through the PADEM uh, standard. And then this is a really exciting time in our industry. There's a lot of uh, great new things that are going on. There are new technologies coming up. Some of those are um, just new to our industry. They've been around in other applications for a long time. Some of those are brand new to the world altogether uh, and our innovations occurring within our industry. One of those in particular, of course, you're hearing a lot about it at Akuma right now, is Ethernet APL, the Advanced Physical Layer, which is the new two-wire Ethernet solution. And as you can see here on the bottom right portion of the diagram, um, we are ex we're seeing that Ethernet IP is going to bring a whole, or, sorry, Ether <laughs> Ethernet APL is going to bring a whole new range of ways of connecting field devices and protocols that can be used for interacting with those field devices. And while we expect that a, a wide variety of Ethernet-based uh, communication protocols will be available to use over Ethernet APL, um, Fieldcom Group in particular is working on two of them. One of those is hard IP and the other is an OPC UA based field device. In the case of the OPC UA based field device, this is a device that would natively communicate via OPC UA and would have the, the process automation device information model, PADEM, built in directly into that device so that it requires no additional hosts or servers or gateways in order to be able to communicate with that device directly in that OPC uh, language and over that PADEM model. At the same time, uh, a large number of our users are already familiar with heart devices. Um, they know how to configure and interact with heart devices. Heart has a, a widespread deployment in our industry already. And so we're taking the heart IP protocol that's already uh, been around for a while and we've layered security on top of that and we're making that available to use in these field devices over Ethernet APL so that you can get the benefits of heart that you've always known, but now at the speeds and the connectivity available through Ethernet uh, with this new two-wire solution. At the same time, we also see other sorts of technology and communications that have been around for a long time in other industries like Bluetooth starting to make their way into the process automation world. And so we're starting to also see possibilities of communicating heart over Bluetooth and things like that through cell phones or handhelds or other sorts of ways of interacting with field devices. And then because we don't want to leave any legacy devices behind, we know that it's important for those to be able to communicate um, to the rest of the system and to the cloud. We're bringing those along, again, using PADEM with the ability to configure lightweight gateways um, using the FDI technology and device info files so that those same existing hard devices or even the new hard IP devices can easily be um, converted into PADEM. And that allows us to better integrate them into the cloud, right? And by, by attaching to the cloud and moving PADEM information um, in its OPC UA based information model up to the various clouds or to business systems outside of the plant, you can enable all sorts of new analytics and big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, all of these kinds of things where you can get better insight into how to manage and run your plant using the data from these uh, field devices that are spread all around the plant. And we're able to do that by bringing together both the new OPC UA based devices and your existing installed uh, heart foundation field bus, heart IP devices through PADEM and making that all that entire set of information available to the cloud applications. Of course, as we start connecting things outside of the plant, more and more in our industry, we know cybersecurity is a cross-cutting and major concern. It's of great importance. And so what we're seeing is that in Fieldcom Group, we're implementing security natively in a lot of the newer protocols that are being developed. OPC UA already has a robust security model as a part of it, and so that can be leveraged on the OPC UA-based devices. Hard IP is now has security built in the latest revision that was released to that last summer. So hard IP can be natively secure. For a lot of the other protocols that are already existing, we're working 
to better understand how to build security around those portions of the system so that they can also be secure for the access from outside world. And then at the same time, Philcom Group has been working closely with Namor and others in the industry on an industry-wide information model. And PADIM is really the first step along that route. And we'll be expanding PADIM in, in cooperation with other organizations to account for more and more devices that exist within our industry. And so with all of this, we have a set of technology that Fieldcom Group has been developing for, for many years that's a robust platform on which many plants are currently built. And by making important investments in that technology, we're extending it to really enable digital transformation in any plant with new with existing field devices or new field devices utilizing this technology. As a part of that, Fieldcom Group has five major initiatives underway. The next generation field device, that is our OPC UA-based UA field device. We have, we're working with other standards organizations in the industry on aligning around cybersecurity. We're working on advancing the HART protocol through the adoption of HART IP for Ethernet APL um, to be appropriate for use for 21st century devices. And continuing to work on FDI as the single device integration solution. And then finally, we're working to make sure that all of this data can be transformed into to, uh, technologies like EOPC UA, MQTP, MQTT, and JSON that are friendly to the IT world. From that, I hope you can see the exciting uh, set of developments that are coming um, for Fieldcom Group and for the technologies that we have available. And I'd like to invite you to please um, take a look at the Philcom Group website, view the webinars um, where we explain some of these technologies in greater detail, or uh, come and join and, and volunteer and participate in the development of these. Thank you very much uh, for listening, and we will be available on the, the chat system to answer any questions that you have. Okay, thanks a lot, Andy. That gives us a great overview of the direction that Fieldcom Group is taking um, in our own efforts in terms of developing standards, creating test tools, developing conformance test suites, um, and generally getting ready and making sure that our members are ready uh, for this digital transformation world and the new technologies like Ethernet APL and PADIM. Um, we're going to head towards a break in just a couple of minutes, but uh, before we do that, I wanted to um, just kind Kind of highlight a little bit more of the of the demo system here. Um, there's a lot of cool technology on, on, on this demo system. Um, it's a very secure system. We have um, VPNs and secure LAN switches and infrastructure provided by Siemens. Um, we have, as I previously mentioned, IoT gateways from Siemens and Pepperell and Fuchs. We have instrumentation from a lot of companies, from Samson, from Emerson, from Vega, who happens to be using a, uh, a wireless heart um, adapter from Pepperell and, Fuch Pepperl and Fuchs. We have a, uh, a, a working valve controller. If you're hearing some background noise, it's probably the valve controller uh, doing, doing its thing. We have some temperature transmitters from, uh, from Corona. Um, and we have a number of other devices over here. We have another valve controller from, um, from Alma. Um, and a Psytrans and, a, uh, and an Anderson Hauser device as well. If, you wanna, if you're a member and you want to put a piece of equipment onto this demo system, we'd encourage you to uh, reach out to us. You go through the marketing at fieldcomgroup.org. Um, so the first question here is about does the, uh, the faster data transfer rate of allowed by Ethernet APL um, allow for use in control applications. What about determinism and are there any plans to combine TSN and hard IP technologies? So, um, you know, one thing to mention is that, you know, process automation applications typically uh, are not that fast. Even the control applications are, are not incredibly fast. Um, and we have done a uh, study of the technology uh, with uh, hard IP in a control environment. And what we've concluded is that as long as there's 30% bandwidth available on, on, on a network, 
um, for non-TSN traffic that you should be able to run any any process application that you that you that, that you need to. And Ethernet and APL specs and some of the other uh, specifications are designed in such a way to um, recommend that in their engineering guidelines for all Ethernet APL based applications um, that are that are not supporting uh, that are not supporting um, TSN. So another question we had um, was, you know, why APL if you can do the same thing with 4 to 20 milliamps and an edge gateway? Uh, control based, you can do control based on 4 to 20 milliamp and everything else via the, uh, via the edge gateway, all of your analytics and monitoring and optimization. Um, you know, that's a good question. And, you know, and I, I'm sure that in some um, areas of process automation, there's going to be some reticence to move away from 4 to 20 milliamp, and we don't feel that, um, you know, that it's going away any t anytime soon. Uh, but you have to kind of look at what the advantages are that this 10 megabit per second speed gives you. Obviously, we're, we're going to discuss this much uh, in more detail later on in the presentation, um, but you end up getting a lot of advantage in terms of commissioning speed and other uh, other advantages that will end up saving money in the long run. So we're pretty um, confident that there's a lot of advantages to Ethernet, Ethernet APL. In the last session, we learned about the strategy for FieldCom Group and the key technologies that will shape the future of, process, of the process industry. Let's shift gears now and speak more about FieldCom Group technologies, starting with hard IP and how it has been used in the infrastructure. Just hard IP slides, next slide. So hard IP grew from needs to better support wireless hard gateways and multiplexers through the Hard 7 development. Hard IP became a formal specification in 2012, including security. It was further updated in 2020 to further specify security, support multiple clients, direct messaging, NTP, PTP, and other network improvements. Several new hard commands were added to support a variety of new features in hard IP. And we updated the test specifications in the heart test system to support hard IP enabled field devices to provide Ethernet APL products to the market today. Hard IP is proven. It's used today in IO systems that support heart and wireless heart products. And hard IP is supported by major systems including control, MO, and asset management. So this brings us to the next video that shows how remote measurement points can be accessed in a virtual worldwide distributed system with state-of-the-art security using the internet and field comm group technology. Kurt Pulser from Pulser Automation Systems uh, used this demo system behind me to produce the material we're about to, to show you and I hope you enjoy it. In the next minute, you will see how remote measurements can be accessed and integrated in a smooth and secure way based on technologies provided by the Fieldcom Group. My name is Kurt and I will guide you through this video. Applications with remote measurements include leak detection, monitoring of pumping stations and water reservoirs, monitoring levels in tanks and silos. All the live demos will be done with this demo system. Here we have condensed automation components of real applications. However, from a communication point of view, there is no difference to real existing installations in the process industries. The benefits of technologies provided by the Fieldcom Group in this application will be illustrated with this OptiTemp TT53 a temperature transmitter from Krone, which is connected to this thematic RTU 3041 compact from Siemens. For the data transfer between both, the HART protocol is used. Using HART has many advantages. For example, there is no loss of accuracy. The RTU supports many protocols to transfer the data to remote systems. Here we will focus on hard IP. This graphic makes it more clear how in reality such an application may look like. We consider a distributed system 
where components and users are in different areas, namely in Australia, in Germany, in Portugal, and in the United States. The remote measurement is deployed in Australia. FDI hosts are installed in Germany, and the server who grants security by managing virtual private networks in so-called VPN tunnels is in Portugal. And finally, there is a user visiting a workshop in US, but we will come to this later. There is a VPN connection between the server to the RTU and to the FDI hosts. The server allows communication between both the RTU and the FDI hosts. Both components can communicate to each other as if they would be in the same local network. How does it look like in a more technical view? I will show it in five steps. Let's consider the virtual private networks first. I connected this client already to the VPN server. There are two VPN tunnels in this list of all tunnels managed by the server. The VPN tunnel to the network with the FDI hosts and the VPN tunnel to the RTU. Remember this IP address. It is used to address the RTU in the following steps. The hard server is a front end which enables the FDI host thematic PDM to communicate with hard IP. In the second step, I show you how to do the configuration. First, I create a new network based on TCP UDP and give it the name Thematic RTU. It is done. And I have to enter an I.O. address by defining the IP address. And this is exactly the IP address which you already know from the VPN server. I have to enter here the standard hard IP port number which is 5094 and make an add. This data comes out of the RTU online and you see the communication works. Here you see again the IP address. I click here on learn to evaluate what devices are connected to the RTU. This is done automatically by the hard server. And you see it has found the TT53 already. And the status is OK. I will have a look on the properties. Here we are. In these tabs you see other information from the TT53. Now I start thematic PDM. I have already synchronized thematic PDM with the hard server and so I can open the Optitem TT53 directly. Here you see the list of all parameters coming from the Optitem TT53. I would like to show now the process values, but before I do that, I close this window here to give PDM more bandwidth. I click here. And here you see the online values coming from the Optitem TT53 process temperature, device temperature, and so on, together with the quality of these variables. I close this window and show you in a next and last step here the 
properties of the communication. I click here on communication and you see that PDM talks to the hard server. The hard server is using hard IP to communicate with the thematic RTU. And the thematic RTU is connected here with channel 1 to the OptiTemp TT53. In the third step, let's presume an engineer who is responsible for our transmitter in Australia participates in a meeting in the United States and must access our OptiTemp TT53. What he wants is to access the device with a web browser in his hotel and in a secure way by using HTTPS. And this would be the engineer's screen in the hotel. But first have a look how this scenario looks like in a communication point of view. So he wants to use HTTPS. Back to the hotel. He opens a new tab and connects to the PDM server. I have already filled in the credentials and I'm logging in. You see here the list of all devices managed by PDM and here you see the TT53. I double click here, PDM is opened and again you see the complete list of all the devices. Here an example that you already know. I open the online window which shows the process variables. This window you already know with the process temperature, the device temperature, and now the online data are coming in, and here you see the data quality. In the fourth step, I come to FDI. FDI stands for Field Device Integration and was jointly developed by leading process industry foundations including Fieldcom Group, FDT Group, Profibus and Profinet International, and the OPC Foundation. Major supplier companies, including ABB, Amazon Process Management, Andres and Hauser, Honeywell, Schneider, Siemens, and Yokogawa, supported the project with significant resources. The integration in FDI hosts like AMS, Fieldcare, Field Instrumentation Manager, Packedware Siemens PDM is done with FDI packages. An FDI package is device type specific, contains all the information needed for device integration, especially how to operate the device. The promise of FDI is one device, one package, all tools. As an example, I will operate the TT53 with a field information manager FIM from ABB, which is installed on the same PC. FIM is using the identical FDI package as before in PDM. After starting the FIM, you find the TT53 here. I open the operate window and the dialog you already know from PDM is open to show the process value of the device. Here you see the values coming from the device, the process temperature, device temperature, uncorrected temperature, and again, the quality of the variables. One more point, FDI supports so-called UIPs. With that, a supplier can support a user to make his job easier for complex tasks. The FDI package for the TT53 contains two such UIPs. You see it here. These are a measurement plugin and a conversion plugin. I open the measurement plugin. What you see here in this dialog is the current value. 
the process temperature, device temperature, and uncorrected process temperature. So you see, UIPs even run in a worldwide communication infrastructure. FDI is an industrial standard and solves the problem of integrating field devices with a multitude of networks, operating systems and control systems used in the process industries. To end users, FDI offers numerous benefits, including a single device package for all host systems and certificate-based security for FDI packages. In the fifth and last step, I will give you a short impression how data acquired from the field level using hard and hard IP can be deployed in the cloud. In the demo system, an IIoT server sponsored by CodeWrites is deployed to a controller sponsored by Phoenix Contact and an Edge Gateway sponsored by Pebble and Fuchs. The IIoT server reads the data using hard IP and publishes it, for example, in Natillion, a cloud-based IIoT ecosystem by Andrews and Hauser. And so it is very easy for the IIoT server to access the RTU in Australia with hard IP and the OptiTemp TT53 with hard and stores the data in the cloud. Here is just a visualization of the TT53 in Natillion. This topic is covered in more detail in other presentations. You have seen how the three Philcom Group technologies, FDI, HARD and HARD IP, have enabled member companies to develop powerful tools and systems to meet the requests of their customers, like saving cost or increasing performance. But these are just three technologies out of many, which are available today or coming soon. All of them reaches out into the future. Thanks for your time. We hope you have enjoyed this video. Okay, well, Kurt just showed us how hard IP and heart can work together to securely monitor assets remotely worldwide. Now I'm pleased to introduce Arnold Offner of Phoenix Contact to discuss some of the ways that Phoenix is using hard IP to provide value to their customers. Arnold, take it away. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Kurt, for that introduction of the use of Heart IP. What I wanted to talk to you about today, of course, is something that is we should, something we should all be aware of. Less than 10% of heart devices are currently being used with all of their true heart capability. In other words, those devices are sometimes connected via a handheld device, they're sometimes used either in commissioning, in setup, in fault finding, but they aren't actually permanently attached. And this makes HART currently in your 4 to 20 applications out there a hidden treasure in your plant. And guess what? You have already paid for it. In other words, you just need to set the HART free. What we've gone and done here is we've wanted to show you some of the things that your HART devices actually have that you could access almost permanently. And what I wanted to show you today is a solution that we developed and launched in 2015 at the Achimer Show in Frankfurt, Germany in June of 2015. In 2018, we then also went a little step further and showed you some of the other capabilities. But firstly, back to your instruments. You have devices in the field that currently have got a lot more information that you can use and you can utilize more effectively now that we're all having to start to work from home. In other words, your flow meter can actually give you totalized flow. Guess what? Reset that value to zero at the beginning of each month, and you'll be able to provide management with a totalized flow value every month. Of course, you can choose the time parameter. You can choose the reset parameter. But you need to find a way to do this in a way that is both cost effective and efficient. And so what I wanted to share with you today is an example of how Phoenix Contact suggests you now take your 4 to 20 milliamp signal, 
which is currently connected to a DC or a PLC, and how you now get at that heart data. Now, I hope this is the piece that will work correctly because when we tried it this morning and yesterday, it worked. Ah, whoops. There we go. In other words, what we're proposing here is that you can tap into your 4 to 20 milliamp signals with proven Phoenix contact technology and use the heart protocol to now extract the data permanently. In other words, use crucial devices and critical devices in the field and connect them using the heart protocol to a device we've always known as the heart multiplexer. So let me take you on a quick just demonstration of how technology has changed. Of course, most of you know about a device that is available in the field right now known as a serial heart multiplexer. What it does is it essentially uses an RS-485 link over a D-sub cable, and cyclically, what it will do, depending on your distance away from the system and installation, it'll provide you somewhere in the area of probably 9,600 board or up to 1,200 board, like I said, depending on distance. The feature of this device, of course, is that it is a multiplexer. In other words, it goes round robin through all the heart devices and meticulously takes data from one device at a time before moving on to the next. And then when it's done all of them, it'll come back around in the cycle and do it one more time. What we launched in 2015 at the Achimer Show in Germany was a device that has an Ethernet port. That Ethernet port is what you see on the very left-hand side of this device here on the right in gray. What you also are looking at next to it are a series of expansion modules that each have a four-way connector, which is connected to one heart device, and each of those connections are their own heart master. Of course, we all know what Ethernet speeds can do for you, and the beauty of this installation is that we're then in a position to actually get access to our data a lot quicker, and there are a number of use cases we can discuss with you at any time. I will bring your attention to the fact that because the industry jargon calls this a multiplexer, we continue to talk about our Ethernet heart multiplexer. But to be quite honest, it would be better if we called it a heart gateway. In other words, it's going to allow you to unleash, unlock all of that data that you're using. And what I wanted to share with you too in my next slide is essentially what it does. It will take the heart protocol and it converts it into an Ethernet protocol. Our focus today will be on heart IP. It can also do it in Modbus. It's also designed to do it in Profinet. And yes, it now comes with a built-in OPC UA server, which makes life very, very easy. So you will start to see some other new ideas we come out with in the coming months and years ahead. So the versatility of this heart to Ethernet gateway cannot be underestimated. It's going to allow you in a full-blown infrastructure of five expansion modules, allow you to connect up to 40 heart devices, four zero. And just to give you an idea what you're talking about here, before you now suddenly say it's too expensive, realize that one such station, head station plus five expansion modules, is probably going to cost you less than one single handheld. And what I'd also commit to you is that I believe for the cost of two handhelds, we can actually install the system in your plant. Of course, one important step to realize is that the connection is going to be made in the control room and not out in the field. It's going to be done, as I will explain in a few moments, right close to where your DCS or your PLC is currently based. The beauty of the installation too, because it's expandable, because it works in multiples of four or eight, means that you can size this system appropriately to satisfy a small junction box in an installation in less than 10 inches of space, or for my metric colleagues, 255 millimeters of DIN rail space. It's important to note too that we have two types of modules. As I said, there are so-called active modules, which are used in new installations. I'll talk about that later. But of course, the key one we're going to use already because your loops are already powered is you will be using a passive module, which in turn will then tap off, off that 4 to 20 link and get all that heart data as and when you need it. 
mentioning again that every one of these connections to a heart device is its own heart master. The other thing I will mention too is that it is actually approved for ATEX, IECX, and UL Zone 2 applications. And of course, minus 40 to plus 70 degrees Celsius, which makes it a really useful tool in any application, anywhere globally, just as Kurt used in his map of the world. The first thing I want to show to you is then how would you install a system like this in your application? Well, firstly, what you're going to be doing is considering the design of the Namur open architecture. Namur, you might not realize it, is actually a very influential organization. And while they might be based in Germany, while they might be working with key German chemical companies that are actually actively globally, they also have set standards over the years that you might not be aware of. For instance, did you know that Namur is actually responsible for what we know today as the 4 to 20 milliamp loop? In other words, the offset between 0 and 4 milliamps is actually a safety criteria. How would you ever detect a line break on a 0 to 20 milliamp circuit without having some kind of offset? And that's why there's 4 to 20 milliamps. 4, to 4 milliamps represents 0. 20 milliamps represents zero, full scale. And 0 milliamps, or anywhere in between, 0 to 4 means huh, you have a problem. You have a wire break. And so that's one of the first things that Namur did many, many years ago. The other thing that Namur did recently, and I'm talking about the last decade, is come up with this idea of what I would call the enhancement of brownfield applications. The idea that there are additional data points inside some very sophisticated field devices in the field that the Namur Open Architecture team would like to get their hands on. The data is actually sent via what they call a data diode. It's really just a block diagram representation of data that leaves the instrument. And what it's meant to do is make sure that the sensors in their operational application are not influenced. In other words, we don't want to do things to the sensor that are going to change its behavior in the application but we do want to get to data that is in that device and use that for other purposes. In other words, one of the ideas is to use heart. And the beauty of heart, as I explained, is that in the automation field, as we show here, those two dots that tap off on the line are now sent via a heart data diode into a system. In other words, we are now able to select instruments we want to get additional data for. And of course, what Namur is working on together with the likes of the Fieldcom group is also how to make sure that that data, as we discussed earlier, is contextualized and that it's set up in such a way that there's no miscommunication or misunderstanding of all the data we're now dealing with. So on to what our application would look like. If you were to take, and these are a set of four slides I will show you, if you were to take your existing installation right now, your heart device is out in the field over on the right, it now runs possibly up to a thousand meters back to a marshalling cabinet or a junction box, which is in the control room. And now using a multi-core cable, we then connect to a DCS or a PLC on the very left of my graphic. Where and how do we integrate our heart multiplexer? Oops, I meant to say heart gateway. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to tap into the marshalling cabinet or the junction box we're going to use the passive modules, which are going to help us modernize these existing systems. And the original design that we had in mind was the incorporation of our Ethernet port using Heart IP with a local area network, a wide area network, over towards a PLC or a, a PC. Think of this as the operating desk. Think of this as the maintenance desk. Think of this as an area secure on the facility which would allow additional folks in your organization, if you're an end user, to then actually check on other details hidden inside your heart device. Because guess what? Your control system is only using the 4 to 20 signal. It's only being based on what's called the PV, the primary value. And those three other settings that you preset into your device, your secondary value, your SV, your TV, your, your tertiary value, or your catenary value, your QV, those device data pieces are only accessible either with a handheld 
or as I demonstrate here permanently with the heart gateway. Darn it. I meant to say heart mux. No, or did I mean heart gateway? All right, so that's step two. The interesting part that we discussed then that we wanted to share with you today, and that's what Kurt already has demonstrated, is the idea of using heart IP then as a communication method. And what he already showed you in the design that is that you will hear more about later today from Michael Gunset from Code Rights involves the use of a controller we know as PLC Next. And one of the attributes that we've been able to integrate into the PLC Next is the heart IP communication. And that is why it's been positioned here right next to the heart gateway. Third step that we then have in mind, and I do apologize if my text block has now covered it up. The beauty of what we're suggesting here too is that you can also use an active module connect it directly to the heart gateway and use it for what I would call non-control functions. Let's say, for instance, it might be the incoming flow meter or the outgoing flow meter of your plant. Piece of information that's not going to be used for, shall we say, a control function, but it might be used as valuable information for management to prove to them just how efficiently your plant is running by being able to show what came in and what went out of your plant. Or to be able, here we're using a flow meter or a pressure meter or a te level temperature, any one of those devices has data that could be very interesting and useful for management outside of the control function. And with that, I've essentially shown you how this installation comes about. The one thing that I do want to mention is that now we're going to use an active module because guess what? Our gateway has to power that device in the loop in the top right. Realize that the connection for the passive module is the one lower right. Okay, so let's show you an example now of what's possible. What we've essentially showed you are two of three application possibilities and use cases that we find are very, very interesting at Phoenix Contact. One, this could be used for asset management. In other words, you can keep an inventory of your devices. You can actually keep tabs on your devices. I'll go into more details in a moment. You can also make sure that you have the latest firmware updates or at least know the firmware level or version that you have in your device. And oh, by the way, you can also keep an eye on calibration. In other words, managing the asset, in this case, the heart device that's out in the field. Which brings us to another step. You can also start to do predictive maintenance. In other words, the heart data is going to allow you to actually do device-specific analysis. It's going to allow you to keep tabs on how your device is performing. Is there any wear and tear occurring? Are there any blockages? Do you have other pieces of data that would suggest that the flow meter is now worthy of a maintenance visit before things go wrong? In other words, predicting maintenance in advance rather than the, oh my goodness, it's not working, we have to fix this quickly. And of course, that helps you too in quality assurance, it improves efficiency, and it'll also prove profitability and effectiveness at your plant. Let's go to some of those use cases. For instance, monitoring a valve. A valve I would consider to be an output device. We send a 4 to 20 milliamp signal to it, and using its control module, it now opens and closes appropriately. But did you know that your valve manufacturer, the person who actually, or the company that sold you or manufactured that device, that integrated heart, also put other pieces of data inside the device? That device, as I said, might be accessible with those two little crocodile clips on a handheld. But nobody's going to want to spend the rest of their life out there with a handheld in their device and a walkie-talkie telling their colleagues what's going on. And with heart, what we now are able to do is actually go ahead, take the heart signal, send it back to the control room, and share it with other folks because heart IP means it's an internet protocol and it also means it's available via the network. So for instance, our device can actually give you additional data. It can give you what's called a valve signature. In other words, as our curve shows here, over the lifetime of the product, as it's being actuated and opened and closed many times, its initial curve will actually move. 
In other words, the amount of pressure needed might increase, which means there's a little bit of drag. It might need some additional lubrication. It might need to be checked and make sure that there's no blockages in the valve. So that's the first thing that our valve signature shows us. The other thing it'll show too is that sometimes our valve closing time is actually going to be slightly, ever so slightly delayed. And why not use the heart signal to keep an eye on that and then be able to say at certain values, that's the time to actually go out there and make sure that it's time now to maintain the device, as I said, predictively. So things like stem friction, actuator pressure can all be monitored using the heart signal. And that's just on a valve. If we were to think about a guided wave, we can talk about optimization there too. The reason being the echo curve will actually provide you with additional information if used correctly. It can actually help us determine whether we're dealing with vapor or whether we're dealing with liquid. In other words, give us an indication that there's a false target. Give us that rejection profile, let us work with it. And oh, by the way, because it's a guided valve, it'll probably also be able to provide us with things like volume. It'll also be able to give us a threshold visit, vis wizard. These are the kinds of things that your heart OEM suppliers are providing you in your device. Why not use it? Another example might be in a flow meter. And realize that I've just chosen some of the topics related to each device because I wanted to make you aware of the fact that some devices actually have a whole host of lists. That list on one single PowerPoint slide would probably be an eye chart that none of us would be able to see. But think about a flow meter. Think about certificates of calibration and how onboard verification is now possible too. In other words, your heart field instrument providers are giving you a lot more data and you're not listening or being connected permanently to it. The one thing that I do want to mention is there is such a thing known as the Universal Command 48. And for those that work with heart, it's an 8-bit string that is used to continuously monitor the status of your device. A very useful instrument if you can send that command down and just keep tabs on those 8 bits would then provide you with an indication of what's going on in each of your devices. And it was this idea that got us started on another idea. What if you wanted to keep tabs on the internal electronics temperature in your device? Guess what? It's in there too. So in other words, if your electronics is now getting warm or hot, as our camera did earlier today, heart will give you that information too. Like I said, it's not part of the primary value. This is one of the other values that's locked up inside and needs to be unleashed from your heart instrument. So what does this allow us to do? Well, as I'm about to show you, we've taken the heart signal. We make sure we don't influence the application. We're connecting it to our heart gateway. We're then tying it in with a PLC Next controller, in this case, a 2152. And we then at Phoenix Contact also have the corresponding security router, which will allow you then to feed this data on into an OPC UA server or the cloud, as we've discussed so far. This is all done within the Namur Open Architecture side channel. It allows you to do such things as digital twins. It allows you to work on such things as data analytics. Another interesting thing, too, is it allows you to compare the performance of your devices with one another. So think about some of the other benefits. Sometimes that information might be embedded in the heads of your service technicians. They actually know which application probably requires more of their attention from time to time than other instruments do. That information can all be shown digitally and confirmed using this Namur open architecture, this side channel of additional data. And oh yes, it's all secure as we've been discussing so far. So our Heart IP gateway with PLC Next represents a paradigm shift for heart multiplexes. Yes, it's a gateway. Yes, it's going to be part of the digital transformation because what we're doing is we're combining multiplexer and gateway functionality. And the reason why I open up the door today to all of you as customers and end users is to then also be able to discuss applications where we might be able to help you 
and prove to you that your existing installation is just two handheld devices away from true digital functionality and a digital transformation. What I wanted to share with you is a function block that we've created, which fits into the Namur open architecture scenario of what is termed monitoring and optimization. And I want to be clear about this. It's not designed for the control function. In simple applications, that might be a possibility. But in process applications, we realize that the DCS or the PLC you're using are probably the most suited application for that part. What we're suggesting here is that the PLC next can actually be used as a gateway to the additional heart data via heart IP. I want to zoom into the function block and just give you a sense of some of the things that we've done in this original proof of concept. In other words, our function block uses the UIP port, the 5094 link, to then connect to the heart gateway. And then what we do is we're in a position to now set various programming steps in a monitoring and optimization function that will allow you on site to now develop a very easy to use monitoring and optimization setup for yourselves. What I wanted to share with you is an example that we've done here. This is essentially a monitoring solution that we term our monitoring solutions for process industries. It's part of our enhanced connectivity hashtag. And here, for instance, what we have is a screenshot of four devices that actually show real time their primary value in the, in, the, uh, in the area of that bar graph to the right of each instrument graphically. What we've then gone and done is added, and that's done via the heart communication is done via the blue line. The heart IP communication is then done between the head station of the heart gateway to the PLC next, and that is where our function block resides. The function block in turn is then going to be in a position to do other things for us. And what I wanted to do is just walk you through a few screenshots and show you how, we, how this actually is built up. So the monitoring solution can also be put onto your cell phone or your tablet. You'll notice here too, there is even a address that we can get to on the device for this very purpose. And this is how we use Heart IP. So back to the example. By initiating our heart monitoring system, this little block, we can then detect all heart, gaze, heart gateways on the network. Here, for instance, the address to the first gateway that we have on a setup that uh, unfortunately we're unable to show you today, but we could definitely spend some time later talking about it. You can also check to see if there are any other networks that have been set up that are communicating in any way with a heart gateway using heart IP. So once we've got the heart IP address, click. We can now choose the gateway setting that will show us which of our connections here shown in green actually have a device connected. This, of course, is nothing more than what's called the live list. The live list is a long list of devices. And to make sure that we can all see it, I've kind of expanded the screen and I have put a little bit of a lasso around the very first one. Uh, HK stands for our heart cart. And what we have here is a Yokogawa EJA Next device. It's a pressure device. You'll see here it's working in our system on heart revision five. It shows a primary value of 0 0.03 bar, and it also shows us our secondary value, which is one of the other settings we set up. Um, if I was to zoom out, I'll be able to show you all the other devices in this table. But here we're going to focus on just the first device, the very first device on location one of our system. So as I mentioned, it shows a heart revision five. And what it also shows here is a last update that we did earlier this month on October 5th. You will notice here too, and this is very interesting about how this data is actually residing in the system. None of this actually had to be entered manually. It was actually read off the device through the gateway and now resides in this table in the PLC next. In other words, the company name, the heart revision version, the primary and the secondary value, all those pieces of detail are actually scanned 
and read into the system. You'll notice we've taken some of our own Phoenix contact devices too, but we've also put a GE Mason Neyland device, Anderson Hauser, and those are the other devices that are actually in this installation um, that is on display on the live list. Now, like I said, this is just a screenshot, so this is not live live. This is post live. All right, so let's have a look some more at what the Yokogawa device can tell us. In other words, there are commands that can be sent to the Yokogawa device, which will allow us to also get some more information. For instance, command 14, where we want to read the primary variable transducer information, all predefined in heart, all predefined and ready to go. So all we do is we click on that particular button, in this case, because that's the one I've circled and that's what my screenshots are about, or we could do some of the other commands. But let's carry on with command 14. And command 14, after just a brief, a brief few moments, will provide us with this as payback. And what we've done in this block is we've created both the number of bytes needed, we've created the description that's associated with it, what kind of a format it is, and also the value that's inherently there. And you'll notice here too, what we've now got is data that resides inside that particular device, in this case, the Yokogawa pressure device. So just to show you that commands can be triggered and very quickly be accessed. Because as I said before, the gateway actually has a heart master connected to every device. So when we send a, a command to a particular device, it's that device we get the response from. We're not dealing with a multiplexer. We're not waiting for cyclic communication to come back around. So command 14 on this particular device can be extracted. It's done a lot faster. And that's what heart IP and that's what heart at the speed of internet, ethernet is all about. All right. So that's going to allow us then to consider another step. And this is where we look to customers out there and end users and any research facility that's interested in this next step. The idea of integrating AI or artificial intelligence into your existing installation. Because this is going to help both your maintenance and your operational support that's going to require real-time data. As we said, the data is going to come through real quick. You're not going to have to wait minutes for it. You're probably going to be seeing this data in seconds. And so this data is going to be very useful if you wanted to start doing anything related to artificial intelligence. And we look forward to partnering with any of you out there. I'd like to then say, in closing, that I'd like to thank you for having paid attention to my presentation. I've left a few minutes for some questions and answers, and I do want to leave my contact details. I'm Arnold Offner, the Strategic Marketing Manager at Phoenix Contact, based here in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And my colleague Nikita Bokharov is the gentleman who actually put this proof of concept of this block diagram together. I'd also like to thank Paul Sereko for his uh, invitation. And I'd also like to thank Sean Vincent. And also I'd like to thank Stephen Mitchkey at the Fieldcom Group for having allowed us to be part of your event today. Thank you so much and I'll open it up to questions. Welcome back. So in that last section, we learned about Heart IP and how it is currently used in infrastructure. Uh, before that, Paul discusses uh, Heart IP and instrumentation. And we need to give you a bit of an overview of Ethernet APL. So to kick things off, Jorg Hanich and Ted Masters will provide some of the basics on Ethernet APL.
Hello, my name is Dr. Jörg Henische from Anderson Hauser Digital Solutions. As chairperson of the Ethernet APL STECO, I would like to welcome you to the Ethernet APL presentation. Process industry is facing a radical change in terms of digitalization. Many projects have been initiated in order to obtain more information from the process to be able to produce and maintain more efficiently and flexibly. Ethernet is a key technology here that connects the field level of process automation system to the industrial internet of things. Both bring a higher degree of uh, digitalization a reality. Ethernet APL not only brings Ethernet to the field devices, but also provides a secure and um, future-proven solution for requirements of process users. The leading standardization development organizations for digital communication and automation system, Feedcom Group, ODVA, OPC Foundation, NPI, and um, 12 industry partners have agreed to a close cooperation to develop a uniform Ethernet physical layer standard for the process industry. In fact, with the cooperation, the most important prerequisite for rapid worldwide dissemination of the standard has been met. Over the next few minutes, we would like to show you how Ethernet APL can be used in process industry. But first, let's hear from the standardization organization that have worked uh, together for more than three years to help make Ethernet APL a reality. Fieldcom Group believes that digital transformation in the process automation industry is a revolutionary concept implemented in an evolutionary way. Bridging the OT and IT worlds requires consideration of the installed base of field instruments, of which over 70 million support the heart communication protocol. The introduction of two-wire intrinsically safe Ethernet APL technology, initially to network switching components, immediately simplifies access to the installed base and drives value for the end user. Meanwhile, enhancements to the Hard IP standard coupled with Ethernet APL now enable Hard IP to be incorporated in field instruments with no change in Hard supported host system software. To support the NOA, Namir Open Architecture, the Process Automation Device Information Model, PADM, provides device information that seamlessly enables enterprise IT monitoring and optimization systems independent of automation protocol while also future-proofing user investments. We heartily congratulate the Ethernet APL project for all the work completed to achieve this significant process automation technology milestone. All right. So, Ethernet APL is an enabling technology. It defines a physical layer with many benefits, and that enables us to deploy heart IP and field devices and continue to bring the advantages of heart into a digital network. We use our proven and very familiar trunk and spur topology. Ethernet APL supports long cable lengths, up to a thousand meter trunk with 200 meter spurs. Field devices can be powered by the network, including two Ys, also known as intrinsic safety. Products can also use higher power and even have separately powered to fulfill the needs of different product types. Ethernet APL Engineering Guide, available from the Fieldcom Group, provides important installation details and helps better understand some of these nuances. Ethernet APL fills a gap. We use Ethernet today in many layers of our network, from our enterprise management to our controller data highways, and previous attempts to extend Ethernet to the field were met with limited success, in part due to the specific requirements of the process automation industry. Ethernet APL delivers the physical layer that meets the requirements of process automation, including intrinsic safety or two eyes, which is an IEC specification, 
the two-wire connection, which supports the Type A field bus cable and other options, as well as power and data shared on the same cable. Robustness is also provided by using the best possible signaling techniques. We'll take a journey from existing installed networks to the digital transformation using Heart IP. Today, Heart-based control architecture relies on devices using the 4 to 20 milliamp or wireless Heart physical layers. Often, the wireless Heart gateway connects to the control network via Heart IP. Today, this connection is through four-wire standard Ethernet. By adding simple Ethernet APL infrastructure, a project can evaluate the ease of installation and configuration offered by Heart IP and Ethernet APL while still using 4 to 20 milliamp. Heart instrumentation and Ethernet APL field switches coexist in the network where the Ethernet APL can provide remote I.O. and have connections to those 4 to 20 milliamp devices. So we can add Ethernet APL remote I.O. to the original network. As instrumentation supporting high-speed Ethernet APL becomes available, the project can take advantage of the 10 megabit per second to dramatically improve efficiency of the system configuration. Also, an Ethernet APL-enabled wireless heart gateway could be directly powered by the field switch. And this, of course, would allow access to all wireless heart instrumentation, as well as bringing in other types of instrumentation. As confidence with Ethernet APL and Heart IP grow, additional infrastructure and instrumentation may be added. An Ethernet APL power switch can provide power to multiple field switches, which can in turn power many instruments. We can also have new instrument types, like video cameras or thermal imaging systems, that can be deployed over the same infrastructure. Also, we have instruments that can benefit from the high-speed communications, products like analyzers and actuators and other high data usage items can be deployed in hazardous areas with ease and also have the high bandwidth and the high speed availability. To migrate Heart IP on the Ethernet APL, the best advice is to start small blend the networks with different physical layers that meet the use cases and requirements for the particular process installation. Heart IP, Wireless Heart, and Heart all share a common data model that has a global ecosystem of interoperable tools and work processes. If you know Heart, then you're already familiar with the core of Heart IP and you're ready to get started with the digital transformation today. Now, Paul will give us more details on Heart IP as the basis for digital transformation at the instrumentation level. Thanks a lot, Sean. If you can flip the slide here, we'll get going on this next section. Um, this next section is called Heart at Internet Speed. And if you recall, the previous section that we did on Heart IP was all about Heart IP at the infrastructure layer, gateways, multiplexers, things like that. In this next section, we're going to talk about Heart IP when combined with Ethernet APL provides a great solution for instrumentation as well. Hard IP over Ethernet APL really can provide a lot of benefits um, to an end user. First of all, it's, it's fast. Second of all, it's, it's, it's flexible. Thirdly, it's seamless. And lastly, it's secure. And I want to de 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 dive into each one of these in just a bit more detail. It's fast. We all know that 4 to 20 milliamp hard is not going to win any races. Um, it transfers data at 1200 bit per second. On the other hand, hard IP over Ethernet APL transfers data at 10 megabit per second. So rather than doing the math and figuring out how fast that is, we did a little calculation about how long it would take to transfer a one megabyte file with, um, with hard 4 to 20 and one with hard IP. And it turns out that it's going to take a couple hours to transmit that file um, at, uh, at, 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 with, with traditional 4 to 20 milliamp hard. And about a second to transfer that file with, uh, you know, with hard IP over Ethernet APL. So just imagine you're in, you're commissioning several thousand instruments at a plant and you're downloading new configuration files to those devices. Think about how many hours you're saving by using Ethernet APL with hard IP. That's kind of a huge advantage. So for commissioning and uh, configuration of, of new units, new you know turnarounds, things like that, there's a big advantage to the speed. 
Hard IP over Ethernet APL is also seamless. What we mean by seamless, as Sean alluded to earlier, is almost all of the technicians, instrument technicians in the world are familiar with hard technology. They know how to use the tools. They know how to configure devices. They know how to configure, they know how to, how to debug and do maintenance activities and things like that using already existing hard software, whether it's an asset management system or a monitoring and optimization system or a, or a you know, condition-based monitoring system. They know how to use hard technology. Hard IP is just hard on another physical layer. So if you know how to use the applications, that are you be that you've used all all your career basically with heart you're going to immediately know how to use the heart ip technology as well what does that mean that means a reduction in training cost um, less startup time for new projects because you're already familiar with the with the you know with the technology and you know just kind of overall general goodness um, because of the knowledge of heart that is already present in your uh in your, in your field, in your field, in your, in your technicians. The third example, uh, the third benefit is what we call flexibility. The flexibility is really a feature of Ethernet APL. Ethernet APL, the network switch, it's just a switch. Right, so you can run multiple protocols on it, much like at your home. You're running HTTP, you're running video cameras, you're running a lot of different features over that same router that's in your house. It's exactly the same thing with Ethernet APL. So a single Ethernet APL switch can support automation protocols, multiple different automation protocols. So let's say you want to run your motor controllers with Profinet, you want to run your core process and your level and your, you know, in, in, in your level gauges and things like that with hard IP and you want to run analytical instruments with Ethernet, Ethernet IP. You can do that with Ethernet APL. So now think about that in the, in the life cycle of a plant. Think about deploying a single IP based network and knowing that that network will be able to accept the instrumentation choices, the automation protocols that are best suited for the application that you're trying to, to find without installing new infrastructure. In the past, in process automation, I think we all know, you know every protocol had its own had its own unique infrastructure, and they were not they they were not shared. This is all changing with Ethernet APL. It's a big deal. Of course, with those that IP addressing going all the way down to the uh, to the field level, it brings in it brings in other issues, most notably security. Uh, and security is something that we've thought a lot about um, at FieldCom Group and our, with our member companies. And it was one of the primary, if not the primary, additions to the recent release of the hard specification um, late last year or earlier this year. Um, previously, hard secu security was required in hard IP devices, but we didn't specify how it was how it needed to be implemented and the types of features that you needed to implement that's changed you now need to import transport layer security tls you need to implement datagram transport layer security uh, there's audit logging requirements and there's syslogging requirements as well that are required for 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 heart for new hard ip and we've built up the test procedures and have developed the the testing criteria so that we can do conformance and validation of hard ip instrumentation and hard ip multiplexers and gateways uh, to make sure that everybody is conforming with all of the new features uh, of hard ip that came in with this release so um, there are a lot of advantages to hard IP, um, and to tell you a little bit more about that, we're going to bring back Peter Zornio, who's going to um, who's going to provide us with a little bit of an with a little bit of an overview on um, on how Emerson thinks about hard IP. And along with him is going to be Neil Peterson of Emerson Automation Solutions. He's a director there, and he's going to give us a little short demo on um, on how. Emerson is addressing Ethernet APL and Hard IP. Let's roll the demo. You know, we've 
thought a lot about how we would bring APL into our control systems. One of the things that you saw in my earlier diagram and that a number of manufacturers are going to make is an Ethernet APL switch. A device that's designed for field mounting has those device connector parts of APL and then the trunk technology, as it's called, coming back from that. We will support these Ethernet APL switches, but we also think we've thought of a better way and a, and a way to really deal with what we think is going to be a mixed environment for a long time for bringing in APL signals. Today, we have a technology we use in our Delta V DCS that we call distributed charms. And what distributed charms is, and you can see a picture of it here on this chart, is it's a field mounted junction box that contains a number of our charms or characterization modules where each charm for each signal can bring in a different kind of signal. This was a natural to us to expand this kind of architecture to also be able to bring in an APL signal. So that instead of having to install an entirely separate kind of junction box or, or field switch device right next to the charms for the analog devices you still have with one junction box with one technology, we'll be able to bring in the complete array of signals, whether they're traditional analog signals such as four to 20 or new APL signals. And you'll be able to do that channel by channel. We also know that redundancy is very important to a lot of our customers in critical industries. So we've made sure that this solution is redundant all the way right down to that individual channel connection to provide just that extra layer of availability. The protocols we expect to support in our first release in the higher priority protocol for us are Profinet and Hard IP. But as a system vendor, we expect that over time we're going to have to support quite a number of protocols. Again, we think that there'll be a number of protocols existing in the market for a while. Ethernet APL is a new technology that is going to transform our industry. It describes the physical layer that many digital protocols can share in a plant's field device network. In this example, we're showing the hard IP protocol, which is a secure protocol, communicating from this digital valve controller and this level transmitter to an electronic marshalling subsystem and onto the controller. Uh, it's also sharing that same electronic marshalling platform can aggregate other signals, such as this traditional 4 to 20 analog temperature transmitter and this level transmitter, which are also heart devices, showing that even though we have a brand new technology, you don't have to retrain all your uh, users of the, of the solution on any new protocol or new tools. They can all share the same heart platform. Hard IP over Ethernet APL is capable of control. This demo shows a PID control loop with an APL level transmitter and the APL digital valve controller. For demonstration, we can move the set point and observe the change in the control output. Ease of use is another important factor and familiar tools for device configuration, calibration, and troubleshooting will facilitate the transition to Ethernet APL. We can observe how the same configuration tools can be used for both 4 to 20 milliamp devices and Ethernet APL devices. These tools are well known by the instrument techs around the world. The user experience for heart devices is the same for both 4 to 20 heart and heart IP over Ethernet APL. Same protocol, just different physical media. All advanced diagnostic tools are available over Ethernet APL. Here, we show an example, the Radar Master application for guided wave radar level transmitters. As the use of Ethernet devices is expanded to the field network, security will be critical. The latest standard of Hard IP includes all the elements required to secure the communications between the field instrumentation and the control system and the asset management solutions that will be provided by the vendors. This demo shows uh, communications from the level transmitter securely to the controller and then securely back to the valve, preventing any sort of uh, tampering in that communications and ensuring that this closed loop control demo uh, comes off without a hitch.
So we've seen that RIP is fast, it's flexible, seamless, and secure. And so now we'd like to take a few questions and have a bit of a discussion about some of the topics that have come up uh, via the Whova app. For those that are in the Whova app, if you have questions, enter them in the app and we'll try and respond immediately and also we'll try to get to them uh, as we go through the sections and then again at the end we'll come back and if we don't get to them today we'll follow up after. Yep, let's play stump the host with your questions. So, <laughs> um, the first one I actually wanted to do was for Arnold. Um, and the question was about um, the types of heart commands that are supported in your product. The heart IP gateway that I showed you could actually deal with any command. And I'll be specific now in saying there are universal commands and there are so-called manufacturer specific. And we can add those all into our function block, which makes our device, let's say, very, very open and actually also expandable to suit any manufacturer's device out there. So we can do all the commands with our device. Okay, that's fantastic. I've got a couple more questions. Both of them are for Sean. Um, we had a question that came in about zone two approval. Um, and I'm assuming uh, that the question is about Ethernet APL field switches versus um, remote I.O. in deployment in zone two. So didn't exactly say that, but I think the, I think the question is sure. if you can deploy an Ethernet APL switch in zone two, is it a replacement for remote I.O.? Okay. Okay. Well, first of all, uh, a switch and remote I.O. are two different types of products. So a switch, of course, is a connection product that allows us to consolidate the ability to have a, a trunk that we then can carry the communications from multiple devices that are attached to the ports of the switch. The remote I.O. offers us the ability for control and handling of the data at the level of the, the remote I.O. installation point. So the devices are actually uh, being handled by, the, uh, by that remote I.O. And so the communication traffic is managed at that level. So from a physical standpoint, they can resemble each other. And it really comes down to the power profiles of the products. The zone approval is determined by the overall power. And there are a lot of uh, specifications and requirements around this. And you know, that's well, well handled and documented and things that we're you know, very familiar with in that particular area. When we design a product, you have the opportunity to design it within a, a certain set of requirements. Within Ethernet APL, we've divide, defined port profiles, and those port profiles vary from the uh, smallest port profile intended for uh, something that's intrinsically safe, all the way up through uh, you know, 50 watts and greater for handling uh, networks of switches and networks of I.O. So, as we look at the zones, we have limitations on what power level we can support. So the question being, can we put something from zone two in the field? Absolutely. If the field where you're installing it is a zone two field. If we look at how zones are determined based on the presence of, for example, in, in uh, zone zero, that the explosive uh, atmosphere is likely to occur versus might occur versus it's probably not going to occur. So we have the kind of the basic definitions in those zones. If we look at the zone we're targeting, then yes, if we have a zone two installation or a zone two area in our process plant, we can deploy a zone two switch or a zone two IO into the field in that area. And it could even reach beyond that into uh, intrinsically safe uh, distribution points and, and devices uh, down in the lower zones. Yeah. Arnold, can you, can you want to weigh in on that? What kind of market do you see for, I mean, you guys are big in the Ethernet APL and the field switches and things like that. What, what kind of market do you see in the, um, you know, in the hazardous area zones? So the hazardous area zones is a topic I wanted to avoid when I discussed the M&O application of our heart IP gateway, only because the IO points or connections are not intrinsically safe. So they have mm -hmm. to be in a safe area. Um, stand by for some new information coming out soon where we will actually have intrinsically safe heart access for you 
but that will be something um, I guess that's going to be, shall we say, in the next few months. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to zones, you're correct. The the Heart IP gateway, as we currently have it, is really a safe zone installation, not a zone two installation. Coming back to the question, there is one way around that. We could put intrinsically safe barriers between the Heart gateway and instruments in the field. Um, and so that's actually how it's done, but it does tend to, shall we say, not be a very economical solution based on some other applications we're going to be showing the market very soon. Well, you heard it here first from Arnold. Yes, you did. <laughs> All right. So, you know, we have another question here um, that I'm going to have Sean address to Sean. And, you know, the, the question is, would OPC UA for field devices work complementary with existing industrial Ethernet protocols or would it replace them? And before you answer, I'm going to, you know, full disclosure, we are working on OPC UA related projects within FieldCom Group at the, you know, thinking about it at, from the field device perspective. So we certainly have some thoughts on this. Um, we're also working on hard IP and we certainly have some thoughts on that with Ethernet APL. So there's a, you know, depends, I think, on, on, on what your viewpoint is of, of this. But I'm going to let Sean uh, comment a little bit. Well, certainly an interesting one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks, Paul. So the short answer is that within Ethernet, Big E Ethernet, which is the Ethernet APL infrastructure as well as our four-wire Ethernet infrastructure, we can coexist uh, multiple users of that domain based on everyone's using Ethernet. Now, that being said, we have specific requirements sometimes in the field around field devices like we've talked about uh, things like scheduled versus non-scheduled traffic and uh, you know and some of the the bandwidth requirements and, and things for doing control so some of those requirements we would need to manage to ensure that there is the available uh, bandwidth for whatever we want to do for our primary control because that's always our number one focus but for everything else we certainly can use other protocols uh, in the network we also can use OPC UA, uh, as Arnold said, even uh, his product that he demoed as an example, you know, it has an OPC UA server. Uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the, uh, the PA DIM, which mm -hmm. is actually an information model that is designed to, to work within the OPC UA uh, structure and provide uh, a lot of valuable uh, access to the field devices as well as to other equipment. But from our perspective, yes, we, we could have OPC UA at all layers of the network and we could, uh, we, we can follow that through, but the question always is what's gonna, what, what is OPC UA conveying? Because you need that, that information and that's where the PA DIM comes in. Yeah. And we also have the, uh, the hard IP, which uses the hard information model, something we're all very familiar with as well. And that information model being conveyed via the Ethernet frame is also available in that same network. So it's really a question of kind of what tools do you want and, and what systems do you use? Because really when it comes down to it, you can't have control unless the system supports that particular data highway for control. Correct. So Correct. That okay. would be the question. Okay, that's a that's a good that's a good answer, and you know the I think you heard PA DIM mentioned several times in Sean's answer, and um, we're going to take a short break now. It's going to be another five minute break. Uh, give us a little time to grab some more water, and uh, we'll be right back. But when we do come back, we're going to um, devote the rest of this um, session mainly to discussion of PA DIM technology, what it is, why it's important. And we got a couple of really cool demos that we're going to show you as well. So um, let's take five minutes. So in this section, we're going to hear from Frank Fingler of ABB about the importance of the information model and the semantics, which are defined by the PA DIM. So first, give a little bit of a background. Flexibility in networks can mean a variety of protocols are in use, as we've already discussed, that data highway can have, or that uh, Ethernet APL network, or however we want to phrase it, can have many different protocols. So FBI delivers integration technology for the protocols that can be found on the Ethernet APL, as well as anywhere in your process plan. 
So while FDI enables integration and supports the configuration and asset management tools, there's a need for a higher level, for a corporate data summary, for access to faceplates, for the global conditions, uh, production, product inventory, uh, other information that's more of the boardroom or corporate interest. PADIM is the key technology for this global data exchange with all the protocols. So the PADIM enables the machine-to-machine -machine communication and the semantics that ensure that there's a common language to retrieve the data regardless of the protocol, regardless of the device, regardless of the vendor. So now Frank will provide us the details of PADIM. Yes, sure. Thank you very much um, for the brief introduction. And PADIM has been developed for a simplified data access. It is a standardized manufacturer independent interface for machine-to-machine -machine communication, as Sean mentioned already. PDIM is based on the OPC UA standard and provides parameter syntax and semantics for process automation devices and analyzers in future. It is kind of a sorted, prioritized, structured hierarchy, which means a device is an asset and has signals, which represent the measurement function. In detail, the parameter asset ID contains the device tag, which is important for the maintenance engineer to locate the device in case a device health <clears throat> alarm occurs. And each signal has a signal tag, which is used in the PNID diagram to define the inputs and outputs, for example, for a control loop. So you see this in, in the picture and let's come to NOAA, the Namur Open Architecture. How does PADIM relate to NOAA? NOAA defines so-called building blocks. One of them is the NOAA Interface and Information Model, where PADIM is the current implementation solution, so instruments implementing PADIM are NOAA compatible. The NOAA aggregation server as building block should bring data from different NOAA data sources together. Another building block is the NOAA diode and security, which defines security requirements based on IEC 62443 and one directional data floor, or in other words, it ensures that data is read only, and you see this as a green box in the middle of the picture. But there is also one more building block, which is the verification of request, which provides a safe and reliable return path from the monitoring and optimization domain, in short, called in future M and O domain, to the core process control domain, in short, CPC, domain if I go through the future slides. So that is verification of request is to get feedback or in other words, that writing is also possible. This guides to the next slide and there we have also the data flow. So beside building blocks, NOAA defines the data flow with open interfaces based on OPC UA and PADIM. This is a standardized interface between the CPC and M&O domain. And this you see in number one in the picture. The second communication channel is for existing field devices, where also OPC UA and PADIM is used. And that is marked with number two in yellow. Beside field devices in the core process control, also additional monitoring and optimization sensors can be added, for example, for vibration, which use also PADIM as an information model that you can see with the number three in the picture. As mentioned before, the data flow can also go back to the CPC domain from the M and O domain, which could be also a central monitoring and optimization, which you see with number four and five. So at the top of this picture, you have the central 
um, monitoring and optimization domain. Use cases are where the basis for PADIM and were de developed with a newer information model. And PADIM is the current implementation of the newer information model, as mentioned already before. <clears throat> it started with unique asset identification, which is also very important for security. For example, secure identification of devices. Automated as built verifies that what was planned is also built and using parameter which are natively available in and can be read from devices. Dimension design check as a next use case automatically verifies whether a field device is being used properly or not. It could be a counter check against the currently configured measurement range against the instrument range to verify whether the dimensioning of the field device is appropriate for the requirement of the process. For example, a control valve or a flow measurement is under or over dimensioned. Multivariable possibility check is another use case. It is well known that additional measurement values from a field device can deliver lots of additional insights into the process and the physical assets of a plant. For example, a Coriolis mass flow meter is capable to also provide the temperature of the medium. Device health is to have a complete history of the device health of the device. And currently, only the NE107 status is read out in the DCS, but this is far from enough to understand failures from field devices and does not allow a predictive maintenance approach. The goal here is to have a complete data set with history to be able to track the performance of a field device, which includes also the possible course and additional information. All parameters have a unique semantic documentation identi identifier. For the application, a so-called IRD, which stands for International Registration Data Identifier. This ID references a parameter description in which name, data type, unit of measurement, permitted value range, and other attributes are stored. All applications shall know this ID and find the corresponding parameters independent of the communication system which is used. In the next slide, you see um, a matrix which was the basic of developing the NOAA information model and, and as well PRDIM with the use cases and related parameter as well as the EADIS in blue for the IEC 61987 Common Data Dictionary. What is semantic? And why is it important? <clears throat> Assume the left guy says, nice Jaguar. But the guy on the right hand side thinks, what does he mean? Is it a cat or is it a car? And he thinks about the car. So in this simple example, you can see how important it is to have a common language. And that is why we have common data dictionaries, which are independent from protocols. Uh, to have a clear description on parameters and names, what, what is behind, so that there is a same meaning. <clears throat> Another question is, why do we need a name? I think you can imagine it already in this picture. So if you have two identity or uh, two types or two of the same types, two cars with of the same type or, or cats, then you need to identify them. And that is 
why a name is needed. And you see, for cars, you have a nameplate. For cats, you have a name. Coming to the next slide, as a kind of a summary for PIDIM. You see a video diagram of the PIDIM information model, which shows on the right-hand side the interfaces for identification information. I would like to highlight here the product instance URI, sometimes also called AutoID, which is a global unique identifier for the complete device lifecycle, which becomes also readable as a QR code on the outside of a device. As well, it should become part of a digital certificate for secure device identification. Interfaces on the left-hand side, interfaces for device health, uh, details were mentioned before in the use cases, and administration, this interface in the middle above the device health, for example, has a um, parameter to set the display language, if you have a local display, or also factory reset to reset a device. And this complements the PA DIM information model from the asset perspective. But last but not least, the most important part for, for a device is um, the, the function, which is the signal set, which contains all functions like the multiple signals, for example, for measurements a device could provide. For each parameter, an ERD is defined, which enables um, IT to access device information without the knowledge of the specific device. So other software tools, machine could identify the parameter as explained also in this semantic explanation with a Jaguar. With the last slide, I provide an example of a multivariable temperature transmitter, which measures a temperature one and a temperature two. In green, the asset-related parameter um, are visible, and in orange, you see the signal-related parameter, where you see the temperature one and the temperature two. And this are twice there because these parameters, there are two temperature measurements. So therefore, you have the same type of parameter twice, once for temperature one and once for temperature two. Thanks, Frank, for, for that uh, introduction and the review of the motivation and the technical details of PADIM. So now in our next section, we're going to see a demonstration, an example of an implementation of PADIM in a real world product. So we're going to see Andreas Eastman of Vega Grieshaber demonstrate the Vega Pulse 64 with PADIM support. And we can see the actual implementation of the, the signal set as Frank showed, as well as the device information as it looks in a real device connected to some face plates, things that we've already seen scattered throughout the presentations today, but bringing it all together with a real world demonstration. So, Andreas? Welcome. My name is Andreas Eisenmann of Vega, and I'll be your guide to PADIM. You will learn how FDI and PADIM work together to deliver data access and support the needs of all layers of the data model. Today, we will use two radar level transmitters from different vendors, the Amazon 5408 and the Vega Vega Pulse 64. It is important to understand the FDI package helps user with configuration and management of the device. The unique vendor products can be understood by a human. People may require training or learning the interfaces, but a person can switch between different FDI packages without much effort. The FDI packages are very useful within a single facility to engage with a single device at a time. The details of the product operation, maintenance, calibration, etc. 
are all supported by the FDI packages. Machines need consistent and distilled data so tools can navigate to any device and retrieve data across applications without knowledge of the protocols. This automated access can include dashboards and other tools that are very useful for upper management and strategic operations on a global scale. The FDI package can contain PADIM mapping for device. FDI tools can contain a PADIM server for connectivity. Future field devices will even implement the PADIM natively. There are many uses for PADIM. One example could be monitoring any 107 status across different plants. Management summary of assets or global monitoring of key indicators from each facility. The possibilities are numerous and beneficial to a variety of users. Let us look at the FDI package and PA DIM for radar level devices. We have two samples of transmitters from two different vendors. Both are level, both are hard registered, each has unique features. The FDI package for each device reflects the vendor. Users can find the needed data and handle the differences in look and feel. First, we will load the FDI package for the Emerson 5408. We can choose to start with the overview menu. Or we can view the online route menu, which includes the most commonly available measurements. Next, we load the FDI package for the Vega, Vega Pulse 64. Notice that we can navigate to the online route menu and observe the most commonly available measurements. We will come to the height again later. If we look at the user interface coming from the FDI package side by side from the two different vendors, we see that they on one hand show the same values, but as you can see, the information is coming with different labels and in different order. And if this is the base, uh, for the OPC UAA model, then even the OPC UAA nodes uh, filled from the FDI package itself will have different labels. And that's where PADIM is coming, uh, because PADIM will show the values in a consistent way, like defined in the PADIM specification. Now that we have seen the devices from a user's point of view via the FDI package, we will transition to the machine view and benefits of PADIM. We will continue with the Vega Pulse 64 device since I work for Vega and I developed this product, PADIM and the FDI package. The OPC UA client will be used to connect to the device information without the PADIM. Then we will use the PADIM to demonstrate how it improves the accessibility of devices. Notice, when we connect to the server, we can navigate to the connected device. When we open the device, notice the amount of data available from the device. This list will be long and slight different for each implementation. There are a lot of entries with the same labels. And the reason for that is that the OPC UA server feed from the information of the FDI package itself cannot distinguish between internal DD variables and variables uh, that are integrated to be shown on the user interface in the FDI package. And therefore, it gets difficult to find the right entry to see the filling height of the device. We select the one that is providing the measured update. So what is PADIM? PADIM is an information model which ensures that the different informations coming from different vendors are exactly in the same definition, are under the same labels available 
so that there is no more searching for the information. For example, if device vendor A gives the serial number of a device with a variable ser no and the other one with serial no and maybe the third one with serial number, then looking at the PA DIM, it will always be visible with a label of serial number. Now we will switch the connection to the PA DIM server. Notice this is still an OPC UA client connected to the server. The navigation is the same as before, but the menu items are different. This time, the PA DIM is providing a consolidated list of device information. Since we are interested in a measurement value, we will open the signal type, then navigate to the desired measurement. The level device supports the level signal type from PA DIM. Now that we see the filling height uh, coming from the OPC UA server using PA DIM information model, let's switch back to the reference runtime and check if the value are the same. Oh yes, they are. Great job. Now we view the PA DIM data in a use in a cloud application. As PA DIM gives the identical information for the devices of different vendors, it's easy to create a cloud application to visualize uh, the identification of all connected devices side by side. Thank you for your time. CodeRights will now offer a presentation on their Cumulosity cloud tool and show another use case of the PA DIM and cloud access. Well, if you didn't notice, Sean has been replaced during the last video. Welcome, Michael. Michael's from CodeWrites, one of our great partners and the, the host of this demo system, actually. It's sitting in their facility, um, and we really appreciate all of the generosity that they've given to allow us to do this. Uh, CodeWrites is doing some great things in the IIoT space, and we've asked Michael to give us an overview as well as a demonstration of some of the products. So um, we're going to have Michael uh, give it, kick it off. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Paul, for the kind introduction. Welcome, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I really, um, I'm really excited uh, to um, to provide a, a demonstration of um, one of our um, products and, and and projects that we did uh, regarding uh, IIoT based on on PA DIM. Um, so. Uh, Frank and, and Andreas uh, talked already about it and explained uh, what PA DIM is and, and how it helps to simplify yep. accessing the, the data of, of field devices. Yeah. Um, and I would like to um, introduce now uh, our uh, one of our implementations of, of PA DIM um, and, and how this can be used in a real world uh, scenario for monitoring. Sounds good. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so um, yeah, our, our solution here, our product is, is named uh, um, IIoT server, so the, the CodeWrites IIoT server. And um, yeah, that's basically a, a software package uh, that is running on an Edge gateway as a Docker container. Uh, so this means um, basically it's um, independent from the hardware platform. It can run on different uh, kinds of, of hardware platforms. Uh, and it can be just installed and, and run as a, as a Docker container. Uh, so, for example, in this case, uh, uh, we run it on a, a PLC Next control from, from Phoenix Contact. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Arnold was, was talking about it earlier already, um, and, and we refer to that here as well. Um, so, the IoT server um, 
uh, basically uses a, a device type library um, that is pre-installed and that includes the, the information of, of all the uh, field devices. Mm -hmm. And this is based on the available EDDs and, and FDI device packages from Fieldcom Group. Um, and uh, yeah, then it it um, it automatically detects connected uh, devices uh, using yeah, different kinds of field communication services that we have built in. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of these is is hard IP, of course. Um, and uh, based on on the information um, that that we get from from the device um, detection and and from the EDDs, uh, the devices will be identified. And then our server provides uh, all the device data um, in the PADIM information model. Okay. So, um, how does this look like? There you go. Um, yeah, so here we see um, one one part of our, our IoT server is this um, OPC UA server or PADIM server inside. Um, and here we see now the um, OPC UA information model, the PADIM information model. Um, and yeah, so all the detected devices are, are available there, and, and we will have a look uh, into this later on in the in the demo. Okay, now how um, yeah how how can we use this data for a, for a real uh, use case? Uh, this is what I'm I'm going to to show now. There you go. So here we have. Um, yeah, a, a schematic uh, diagram of the demo system. This, this is the entire demo yeah, system is, that we're looking this at. Is basically, the entire demo okay. system, right, Paul? And I'm guessing that the um, yellow parts mean something. <laughs> and yes, we have. Uh, I have. I have highlighted the, the yellow parts here, and and uh, the yellow parts are basically um, yeah the the, um, the parts that are that that are used in in this demo. Um, so this is um, a valve uh, in this case. Uh, so we have it here from. from from FlowServe, uh, then um, a hard, yeah, multiplexer. Oops, uh, mm -hmm. anyway, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, from Phoenix. Contact. Oh, it's actually over there. Uh, okay. That's over there. Yeah, yep. and uh, and then we have the, the PLC Next control also right from Phoenix there. Yep. right there. Mm -hmm. um, and what we cannot see here is the cloud application, uh, which is sitting <laughs> somewhere in the cloud. In the cloud. <laughs> um, and that is and that is also from from FlowServe in this case. Uh, so we can connect to different cloud applications, but for this demo, um, uh, of course, we, we use the, the FlowSoft um, cloud portal. Okay. Um, they have built that, and here we see uh, the, the setup uh, in, in more detail what, what we use here. So we have the valve positioner from, from mm -hmm. FlowSoft, the logics. Um, so and that's right. talking heart, standard heart. Yep. That is talking standard heart. It is connected to the, um, mm -hmm. the heart gateway mm -hmm. uh, from Phoenix. Um, and then um, via heart IP, we have a, a connection to the uh, PLC Next control. Mm -hmm. uh, and there uh, we run our um, IoT server okay. uh, that publishes mm -hmm. the PADIM information model. Mm -hmm. Uh, so we can easily access it uh, via OPC UA. Also, from, mm -hmm. you can access it from any uh, OPC UA client. Um, in this case, uh, we are yeah, uh, selecting and, and publishing uh, all the important information from the valve mm -hmm. uh, to the cloud. And therefore, as a transport protocol, uh, we use MQTT. Yep. Um, yeah, and then uh, the data gets gets uh, yeah published and then further um, yeah displayed and, and analyzed in the in the portal uh, from FlowServe. Okay. Yeah. So um, that is the setup. Now mm -hmm. well, let's uh, have a look at how this looks like in practice. Um, therefore, I would like to enable the my screen sharing. I don't know if that works now. Yes. Okay. There you go. Okay, so first of all, uh, let's have a look at our uh, OPC server um, inside inside the IoT server. Uh, so here I'm I'm connected now with uh, with an OPC UA client, so the, the well-known one from from uh, Unified Automation. Um, I'm connected to the uh, to the server here. 
and then we can have a look at the um, information model. So we see the device set. Uh, inside the device set, we have uh, the connected devices. So this is um, a number of devices here in the in the demo system. So for example, we have the level transmitter, the 5408 from, from Amazon. Uh, then we have our Logix um, positioner. Uh, and, and and two more devices now here. Okay. So we can then further explore the information model, and so it looks exactly the same as what Andreas showed <laughs> already mm -hmm. before. Yep. Um, so then it's important that um, maybe we will have different uh, uh, different products in, in in future, but they they will all uh, all support this PADIM information model, and this means they'll look the uh, same in these look, trees. They look yeah. the same. Yeah. Get the same information. So for every um, device, um, uh, we can get the the identification information here, like. Um, yeah, the, the, I can see the, the manufacturer um, or the model. So in this case, it's Rosemount 5408, um, the device health, and so on. Um, and yeah, this is for, for each uh, device here. And then we can go to the uh, logics position. <coughs> yep. Uh, and, and also here, uh, we have the same, the same kind of uh, information. Mm -hmm. so, Okay, looks like we have here the model. Uh, we can bring up the device health. So mm -hmm. it's, it's in normal condition and so on. Yeah. Um, now what we are doing here is uh, we, of course, we use the information uh, which is uh, available and standardized in the PADIM. Mm -hmm. uh, but additionally, uh, for this use case, um, we also need some some more device specific data, you know, to to analyze uh, the valve, uh, okay. yeah, performance and conditions. Um, and all this data, all all the um, data that the device provides, is is also available in the complete parameter set of the device. And you can see here that this is really uh, a lot of information here. Oh my gosh. Um, so not 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 all of, of this information makes sense to standardize it in the, in the yes. standardized information model, but for some yes. use cases you might need it. You might or, need or this extra it. stuff, yeah. Uh, this extra mm -hmm. stuff, and that's that's what we are using here for uh, for this use case. Um, so it's actually about um, um, 100 uh, different data points mm -hmm. uh, that are used here and uh, that are read from the device and, and published to the cloud portal. Okay. Okay, now, now let's, um, in the next step, let's have a look at uh, how this looks like in the, in the cloud application. Therefore, I'm switching. Oops, no. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, nope. <laughs> that's so, okay. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Um, yeah. So here we see now the um, uh, the, the, the flows of uh, Red Raven portal. Yes. Um, so at first we see an, an overview. So this is an asset uh, dashboard. Um, so if we have multiple assets uh, that we are monitoring here, which is usually the case of course yeah. um, then uh, then we see an overview of the conditions uh, in the different locations or sites uh, yep. and then we can dig deeper into this uh, so if i look at this it looks like there's three devices two of them are healthy and one of them is yes, showing a, them is a yellow like, alert uh, yeah maintenance required so okay this is, this is the valve the, the position of itself they yeah the three that we have here that yeah. they are yeah. all good yeah um and these are the you know, any 107 parameters, right? These are the any any 107. Yeah, 107. Uh, okay, yeah. Else, I think yeah, else, yeah. Else, yeah. Okay, uh, exactly the the ones here. Okay. Okay, then we can uh, we can yeah we can we can also display this as a um, as a map here where our devices are located, so we can uh, mm -hmm. identify that, um, and and we can go into more detail and and um, yeah show the devices of a specific a specific, show, specific uh, device yeah. or site mm -hmm. and then and then go to a specific device um, and this is now the device uh, here in our demo system mm -hmm. um, so we can show the um, the dashboard here 
um, and and see the the current values. Mm -hmm. So the yeah command position, uh, the different pressure values. Mm -hmm. um, I think this was also something that um, Arnold uh, talked about earlier for this uh, valve monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is all the right the variables that we see here. Right. Uh, we see um, that. Um, uh, this is currently um, yeah, out of specification um, and we have an indication here that our analog output range is too small. So this is basically the signal that we are getting from the PSC. So some indication okay. that it's not calibrated correctly. Mm -hmm. um, also we can um, get more information uh, here about the status of the device. Or not only of the device, but also of the yeah, mm -hmm. of the valve and actuator. Uh, oh my! Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, and if ever if anything goes goes wrong here, it is um, it is indicated here. Mm -hmm. So here in this case, for example, um, it shows some calibration errors, and this is why the analog output range is is too small. And ah, okay. The calibration errors are down there, down at the bottom of the screen. Okay. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, Okay, then we can also show some trend information here. Um, so, the, yeah, the movement of the valve uh, mm -hmm. can be monitored over time, or mm -hmm. call it. Um, we can do a signature a comparison of the valve signature uh, yep. to some uh, pre-recorded signatures. Yep. I, I do not have this available right now because we just yeah, installed yeah. it sure. last week. <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but this is all something we can um, do here and and find. And this is all running out of the cloud. And this is and it's and, it, and, and it's securely. Connected, connected into this, this in, 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 into this system. All right. Okay. All right. So yeah, here we can um, yeah yeah bring up the uh, information uh, like uh, serial number, device type, uh, mm -hmm. tag number, and, and mm -hmm. so on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great, and this is a this is an active FlowServe product. This is an active FlowServe product. Yeah. That is that's right. basically supporting PA DIM technology. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. And and, and, and yeah, and, and even it's um, yeah, it's it can be used not only for uh, flow soft devices but also for other devices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow! Fantastic. That's that's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, what else would you like to show us? Is there anything else, or are we going back to your PowerPoint? Now? I would like to go back to the presentation. Okay. It's, and I would like to summarize. Yeah, so I would like to give a, a short summary. So, um, yeah, so the, the availability of data, in my point of view, is uh, is, is crucial yeah, for for future optimization, mm -hmm. um, performance improvements, and and also cost reduction in in process industries. And and we have uh, yeah several examples there where we do projects. Um, then, uh, of course, the, the field devices, uh, we, we learned that today, they, they really can provide a lot of information. Yeah. yeah. So also via hard, but yeah. this information is not used today or mm -hmm. rarely used today. Um, and um, yeah, NOAA is an, is an architectural concept uh, to existing, mm -hmm. extend existing plant infrastructure and, uh, and read out and, and provide this data to um, monitoring and, and optimization use cases in a, right. in a secure way. Right. Um, so, yeah, mapping mapping the device device data to a standard information model like the, the we have with the PA mm -hmm. now um, is is required to, to ensure a consistent semantics. Um, yeah. If we deal with many devices from different manufacturers especially, uh, and our code rights IoT server is a, a practical NOAA solution, uh, which is yeah, easy to set up and uh, it, it retrieves all the device data that is available mm -hmm. um, and makes it really easy to, to access this, this data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, and yeah, as I said, we can, we can also yeah, uh, provide this data on-premise via OPC UA. You can sure. use it and, and we can transfer it to sure. 
to cloud platforms like uh, the one we have seen here, but there are. Yeah, and I, you know, in in some countries, uh, the security regulations require this stuff to be on premise, and in other places, you can do it in the cloud. So that Absolutely. flexibility is very valuable. I think you know what 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 struck me from this presentation and 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 Andrea's presentation is the um, the notion of semantics, which is kind of a hard thing to grasp for me at least and you know what I what I liked is I is is when I noticed that you know the PAD model has this field called signal set and each 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 variable is kind of has a, a standard label so if vendor a calls their level fill height and vendor B calls their level level height and vendor C calls it you know tube level or something like that, by the time the PA DIM server looks at the information, it all becomes labeled level. You know, and that's yeah. that's I think that's that's an important thing to do because we do know that we do know that you know the labeling on DDs of a lot of instrumentation is not it's not consistent. It's nowhere near as consistent as it could be for yeah. a lot of different yeah. reasons. For you know, for a lot of different reasons. In some cases, it may just be um, language. You know, it may you know maybe one's in French and one's in German, and they both say level, but you know, a machine is not going to be able to figure that out. <laughs> so interesting. Or it's different uh, because of the of the different communication protocols. Yeah, yeah, protocols. that too, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. so. It's different data types uh, and, and so on. And okay, well, hang out here for a second until the next transition. Um, sure. And, you know, I, I, for the audience, I want to thank you for joining us today. Um, this has been a rather long um, thing, and trust me, it's been long for me as well. <laughs> um, and I promise we're not going to, we're just about done. Okay, but before we get to, uh, before I wrap up with the final set of questions and, um, and some thoughts for you all to ponder, um, our great um, president and CEO, Ted Masters, um, is here to join us and provide us with some closing comments and a few, few short slides. So, uh, Ted, um, take it away. Okay, thank, thank you, Paul, and thank you, Michael, for the, for the nice demo there. Uh, and really a thanks to all of our cast of members that have uh, participated and produced products on the demo wall. Uh, there's nothing more exciting to see uh, than the new products that take advantage of these technologies. You can develop all the technologies you want, but until uh, our members are developing products around them, uh, then, then they become a reality and, and valuable. So it's really exciting to see that. Uh, I'd just like to make a few uh, comments on how both uh, users and suppliers can get started or, or continue on the path of, of uh, digital transformation with, with the, some of the new technologies that you've seen today. Uh, so first of all, it, it starts here. Philcom Group really is the home of process automation standards. We, we're solely focused on uh, the process automation industry growing every year, and, and we really partner uh, with our members to develop these technologies. So it's a great place to, to contribute and to, to partner in, in, into the next uh, generation technologies and, and help each other along in uh, developing products that are valuable to our users. Uh, we have so much expertise with uh, essentially the who's who in the process industry uh, that participate with us uh, further to validate the uh, the technology and the products. Uh, the the uh, the registration mark really is a seal of approval for process automation. Uh, you know when uh, for for all the various technologies. So uh, hope hope you can participate with us if you're not already. Uh, second secondly, we we've really got to consider. Uh, the installed base of over 50 million field devices. Uh, in, in the spirit of digitalization, uh, I've said it many times and talked to many users, but nobody's ripping out field devices to digitally transform their plants. We've got we've to start with the massive installed base that's there. And, uh, and, and a lot of them you've heard about today and preparing to add uh, new technologies for higher performance. Um, Philcom Group, is uh, developing new technologies with that in mind to be backward compatible. And I think you've seen uh, air, uh, ways today that uh, a new field device can, 
can communicate in the same manner as a, as that install base uh, bridging over into the same uh, information models and, and merging the chasm between OT and IT for uh, uh, in, in various ways in information models and integration. Philcom Group has, has uh, evolved in this area of digital transformation. Really, as we started out developing uh, field device protocols, uh, we've really de developed into the ultimate goal of common data standards. And a key, a key to that is FDI, which delivers data all, all around the hosts and cloud and mobile applications in a, in a common way uh, and configures and manages all the assets with the same package, regardless of, of supplier, regardless of protocol. Uh, it is truly the integration standard for our industry. And uh, as you've heard today, a lot about the process uh, automation uh, device information model, PADM, is, uh, is really the ultimate goal of mer merging all the data in a common format for use by all types of analytics and applications. Uh, as uh, Paul mentioned earlier, it, it takes data from all different sources and puts them in a common machine readable way that uh, you know these applications can take advantage and leverage the data in a common form and turn it into value. So uh, it is a digital revolution going on, but for a lot of the aforementioned reasons, we have to evolve to get there. And I thought it was interesting how uh, uh, at the beginning of the day, Paul talked about how we've evolved and, and uh, our industry really kind of needs to evolve, uh, you know, in, into all the new technologies. We need a, a planned and, and uh, stepwise way to, to get into that. And, uh, and that, that has been our history. We've evolved uh, into pneumatics, from pneumatics to electrical. Uh, I, I remember stomping around a lot of plants where you still see I to P, I to P converters and P to I converters, so so it's it's clearly an evolution for for decades, uh, you know, really, uh, you know, back back in the '80s, maybe earlier, uh, and then of course we evolved from those electrical signal signals to to adding digital, uh, and the, and the heart protocol, uh, going on to a lot of pure digital protocols, and now we're really developing uh, solutions for the future. Uh, we had a great presentation with. Uh, Arnold and he talked about really taking advantage and capturing that stranded data that's in field devices and we have a lot of ways now to do that very economically uh, that that problem is, has been solved uh, we have a common way to integrate all the devices of different protocols in a standard way through this uh, common uh, device package that is adopted now in the industry and and that's that's completed uh, and now getting uh, the data in a standard model, PADM, to, to really leverage the value uh, has been widely adopted in our industry and beginning to be integrated in more and more products all the time. So we've got, we've got that solved. Uh, accelerating heart to the speed of uh, 10 megabits per second with APL is uh, really exciting. We're uh, nearly there and uh, that, that's uh, kind of the, uh, uh, you know, one of the one of the ways to make that install base uh, so valuable and and uh, have the performance that you need for the future and still uh, maintain and leverage the familiarity of heart and the compatibility. Uh, and in the future, uh, we're working on new things uh, ultimately toward uh, field devices uh, without without a protocol. So. Uh, many new projects going on at Philcom Group with the, uh, what you've heard today, as well as uh, the new technologies that we're, we're working with. So with that, I would ask you to come join us. Uh, we appreciate all your attention today and hope you share the, the vision of our uh, strategic technology direction. Uh, you can join us in a number of ways. Uh, if you're not already a member or if you are a member to be active in the working groups where we develop these specifications and project groups that we work on, you know, certain components of that. Uh, so we encourage you to join us in these uh, working groups or uh, in other ways, you can check out the website uh, where we have suppliers of, of all of the registered products, ways to help you get started and uh, developer kits and other types of resources and training. So 
uh, I hope you you uh, share our vision and and the steps that we're already at in terms of helping uh, members and suppliers digitally transform the process industry. And I just want to thank again all the sponsors that have participated and showed us a lot of these products and solutions that are really valuable to the users to help them along this path. Uh, and I appreciate uh, your time and attention today uh, for, for joining us. So thank you very much and please come join us. Thanks a lot, Ted. That was fantastic. Um, nice closing thing and certainly brought up a lot of points that are um, that represent the value of FieldCom Group membership. Um, we've got a lot of members already on the line. We've got a lot of end users and other other, other entities, and um, it's good for you to explain, you know, some of the benefits that we provide to the industry as clearly and concisely as you just did. So um, we're going to be answering closing questions in a couple of minutes. Uh, but first, after participating in this workshop, and honestly, after a lot of the end user presentations that I give, um, I like to ask a question of, are you ready? You know, are you ready to consider taking on some of these, some of these um, challenges and in, in adopting some of these new technologies? So, um, let's get the next slide up here, and I'll and I'm going to ask you some questions. So, I ask a lot of questions to people when I do these things because it, it somewhat makes them think about um, where their gaps might be and how they might do better prepare themselves for the digital trans the world of digital transformation, um, assuming they want to be prepared for the world of digital transformation, which I know not everybody does. But, um, you know, one of the questions we always ask is, are your devices primarily used for monitoring or controlled as a supplier? Um, I'd ask you that because it kind of indicates whether or not, um, you know, you're, you're, you're going to really need to take advantage of some of these some of these things um, and as you're a user obviously I think you should um, anticipate that in the in the coming decades you're probably going to be putting in a lot more monitoring and optimization instrumentation than control in instrumentation so um, how you're going to manage that is an important important thing to recognize um, we talked a lot about 10 megabits per second and we got a fair amount of questions about 10 megabits per second um, we've answered a couple of those um, and you know we we you know we think that there are some pretty solid benefits to higher speed um, the obvious one is the configuration and the commissioning but some less obvious benefits are the ability to put um, you know, a lot more functionality into an instrument um, that you can then pull out of the instrument. So if, imagine an instrument with an embedded device driver or an instrument with, um, you know, with user interfaces already embedded into the device. You can do that and, you know, have better access to it um, and maybe um, more timely access to it than you would with current systems. Um, you know, are you comfortable with an Ethernet-based field network? You know, you're now going to have all of these devices on the plant floor. They're going to have IP addresses. We've tried to address that today with uh, security. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, we've built what we feel is a very robust and very solid security solution. Um, and there are um, myriads of security best practices out there for you to consider uh, following. So I, I, whereas, you know, five years ago, I would say there's a, a, a strong reasons to not consist, not consist consider you know IP instrumentation on the factory floor um, I, now I'm not so sure that those restrictions are, are, are necessary anymore um, are greenfield applications a large part of your plans obviously if you're planning on building a new plant um, you know putting in an infrastructure that can run any protocol basically because it's all, it's all Ethernet um, is advantageous than having to plan out from day one where your you know where your heart runs are going to be and where your foundation field bus runs are going to be and where you know where you're going to put other things so you know there's some some really good benefits there um, I like to ask people too what their internal capabilities are and what their long-term plans are for modernization. That's a really important point. Um, you know, we all know that the workforce in the process automation industry has not been getting younger, but eventually it has to get younger, <laughs> um, <laughs> unless somebody's, <laughs> you know, come up with some longevity treatments that I'm not aware of. Um, and you know, and as you know, but your current workforce, you know, are they capable of making this transition? 
And if not, what do you have to do from your work, from a workforce perspective, um, to uh, to enable some of the digital transformation technology? You know, maybe you got to have some of the folks that have been and that that spent their life being educated in internet technologies. Um, maybe they should need to take on some projects or some evaluation projects for this technology because it's something that they're pretty familiar with. Um, and lastly, um, you know, a lot of what we've talked about and what Namor is talking about is uh, monitoring and optimization um, and doing much more of it so that you can feed cloud systems and, and, and add better analytics. And if you're running multiple plants, figure out ways to optimize all of your plants based on input that you're receiving from, from the broad array of facilities that you're managing. So I would encourage all of you, if you're a user, to ask yourself these questions and then you know, make a decision on what kind of strategies and tactics you need to implement in the next two to three years, um, starting immediately, frankly, um, to take advantage of some of these technologies. Because th th they're coming. Um, I promise you they're coming. And they are going to, going to change things. So I think we're just about done. We're going to answer some questions next. I got a couple doozies that I'm going to throw Sean's way, but so I got to open a. I got to give him a beer to to, to to start with, and I I think I might do that too. It's um like 5:30 here in Germany or something like that. So it's five o'clock somewhere. So we've got yeah. So we're 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 legit. You know, it's 5:35 here in Germany, and um, let's go with a question here. So we've gotten a lot of questions, Sean, that kind of to me indicate. Um, like a little bit of confusion about Ethernet IP technology versus heart IP technology and, um, and their usage over Ethernet APL and things like that. So can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there are a lot of terms and a lot of terms that get reused and used in different ways. Gross, by the way. Uh, yes, gross. <laughs> so first of all, Ethernet IP is a protocol. Uh, it's an industrial protocol, hence the IP. Uh, that is from the ODVA, that's a separate organization. However, they were part of the Ethernet APL project. So Ethernet APL does support Ethernet IP protocol. It also supports Heart IP protocol. And in Heart IP, we support Internet protocol IP. So. There. So our IP stands for Internet Protocol, and theirs stands for Industrial Protocol. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's all about <laughs> whatever, yeah. Right? But in the grand scheme of things, we are familiar with TCP IP being the Internet Protocol as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so with the Internet Protocol, if we're referring to that, that is a method of Ethernet conveyance. So it's a, a way that we can manage the, the network uh, with Ethernet. And yes, we support that with Part IP. And yes, hard IP will exist on Ethernet APL. And if it's a question about what protocols will be available on Ethernet APL moving forward, uh, the answer is many. Yeah. And we had four that helped to create the technology. And as controllers and systems expand to support the physical layer, as well as expanding to support more of the control use cases uh, for those protocols, then you'll see an expansion in the, those protocols and their usage. Yeah, and I, I think one of the fundamental um, one of the fundamental thought shifts that needs to happen amongst uh, plant designers and systems engineers is um, this notion that you no longer have a dedicated infrastructure. You have a common infrastructure, Ethernet infrastructure that can be used to run, you know, best of class automation protocols for the application that you're trying to do, or even connect other devices that are not traditionally thought of as process automation in, 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 in instrumentation. Now, I, I, you know, I'm not an end user, but it seems to me that in some of your hazardous areas where there's a lot of heat, um, having thermal imaging cameras that are, you know, that are, that are taking a look at, at, at what the heat profile is in a particular unit, um, having that in a, in a, you know, in a, you know, in an intrinsically safe area running Ethernet um, APL over a 200 meter 
you know, spur length, that seems to me like it's something that would be pretty advantageous. It's not hard IP, it's not Profinet, it's not Ethernet IP. You know, it's it, it's something different. So you need to embrace the um, the possibilities that come with deploying an Ethernet infrastructure into the. Uh, you know, into the uh, in, in, into the environment. So and I think also APL with Ethernet APL, mm -hmm. we've introduced an opportunity to extend Ethernet, you know, beyond the hundred meter mark and go into the thousand meter trunks and the two hundred meter spurs. Yeah. And that creates so much opportunity, like you said, for the you know, rethinking what our infrastructure looks like. And mm -hmm. Fuelcom Group is well positioned there. Yeah, our technologies today and for the future with our future projects. Mm -hmm. Sure. So another question here is, um, you know, and, and I, I think don't we use standard FCG libraries to have the same label for parameters across all products and vendors? What's the difference with uh, PA DIM? Yes. So now one of these is the FCG thing because PA DIM is protocol independent, but I'll let right. you de I'll let you deal with that. Right. So. So. That is a, a key key phrase there. So the, the PA DIM supports uh, many protocols, any protocol, and it would just need mapping from an existing protocol into the uh, the semantics of the PA DIM. And we can do that today for a heart device or an FF device or for other types of products. And we can bring that data, as we saw in uh, the demos today, mm -hmm. we can bring that data forward through PA DIM. And we've kind of obfuscated away from the protocol. Yeah. So with the libraries, those are geared towards the device descriptions and the FDI packages. Mm -hmm. And that's to ensure consistent usage of labels uh, amongst a protocol. Mm -hmm. So when we look at things like uh, if we want to know the uh, manufacturer ID of uh, a field device, we know that manufacturer ID in a heart device is using a certain label. And we know that in an FF device, we use a certain structure as well. Mm -hmm. And those are by protocol. Yeah. So PADM just takes it up a, a layer. Uh, yeah. And also supports the machine to machine, whereas DDs and FDI packages are more geared towards asset management configuration where you have uh, a lot of times a human or a, a, a specialized database. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was I was very intrigued by the um, the Andres Eisenman demonstration where, you know, he first showed the Rosemont level transmitter where they labeled level, yes. you know, and then he showed the same a, a Vega level transmitter where the, the same field they labeled at fill height. So, yes. and you know, the mapping of those two variables into heart variables, I guess DD variables into a signal set that is a name of level seemed to be, seemed to resonate with me and make, make sense on why this is sort of, uh, you know why this is important, yeah, particularly yeah. in machine-to-machine -machine communication. For sure. You know. Yes. And that's a, you know, the machine-to-machine, -machine, the the machines can't really differentiate, whereas we, um, as a human, can see that. We yeah. can read it. We can understand. We can that. converse. We can converse. <laughs> yeah. And also, as we gain experience with the products that we have installed in our facilities, we learn how each of those products is structured. Whereas okay. A machine to program it to do that would be um, would not be advantageous. Okay, got it, got it. So a couple cleanup questions, and if you have any pressing questions that you really want an answer to, type them into the Whova application now. Um, we have been recording this um, <laughs> with, with all of its trials and tribulations, um, and uh, those recordings will be available on our, on our YouTube channel, and if you're a register, registered, we'll send out a link for how you can access the materials. Um, and that's the best way, really, for you to get at the presentations and, and, and the content. So um, are there any other questions or any other comments that anybody would like to make? Um, did you enjoy this? Would we, should we do it again sometime? Not for a little while, but sometime. <laughs> and, we gotta let the camera cool down. Yeah, we gotta let the camera cool down and change the batteries and, and things like that. But um, again, thanks everybody for joining us and uh, prost. Prost.